All right, they, they broke uh, the SAT down into what's referred to as heart of algebra, passport, passport to advanced math, problem solving and data analysis, and additional topics in math. All right, and those are the highlights. Those are the things I feel like if you're an expert at, then you're gonna master the test. It won't be a problem at all, all right? Now, uh, from there, um, they just go through and, and what we're doing in this particular pit place, the next kind of topic is just the strategies involved. If you don't know something, how you can figure things out. All right, and I'm just gonna demonstrate that as we go through the test. All right, I'm gonna demonstrate that through the test. And if you're familiar with that, you should be okay. All right, now, uh, next, all right. The heart of algebra on the test has 19 questions. Believe it or not, it's always standardized. It's always kind of the same. So heart of algebra is uh, a pretty important topic. All right, so uh, we spend a little bit more time, I think, working on that component of the test. All right, and these are all the topics. All right, and again, um, I don't really want to spend much time on this. I'd rather just jump in and get started, try to help you as quickly as I possibly can. Um, systems of equations is super important topic. Uh, and of course, we do graphing, substitution, elimination. You have to do all the different topics. All right. So now, sample problems, heart of algebra. Listen, guys, what I'd like for you to try to do is, um, what I would like for you to do is spend time all right, and if you don't mind, all right, we're gonna go ahead and work on question one and two. All right, let's work on question one and two, and let's just warm up a little bit, all right? And what I'll do is I'm gonna say out loud, all right, how, what my thought process is, and you're like, man, I already know how to do this. I'm totally fine with that also, but I just wanna show you what my thought process is, how you can read a problem, all right, and see if you understand exactly what's going on. So here we go, let's take a look. <laughs> All right, number one, it says the graph of linear function f has intercepts at a zero and zero b in the xy plane, if a plus b equals zero. So the first thing I want you to do is highlight a plus b equals zero. All right, now if a plus b equals zero, I would like everybody to say that a is the opposite of b. A is the opposite of b. All right, now, why do they say A cannot equal B? Because they don't want you to do what? Zero plus zero equals zero. So I agree with that. All right, now I personally think symbolism is the hardest thing. All right, and I think that's where most kids lack. They're not understanding what the question is. So at any point in time, if you're not sure exactly what I'm saying, please let me know and I'll be happy to say it again. All right, or make it more clear for you, all right? It says, which of the following is true about the slope of, gra of the graph? Now, since they're referring to the slope, I want everybody to write down m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's super duper important. All right, that's always used. All right, now what I'd like for you to do is, you see where it says a0 and 0b. All right, let's just calculate the slope. All right, so if I were to calculate the slope, I would say B minus zero over zero minus A, or I would say B over negative A. Now, remember, you're allowed to stop me at any time, say you're going too fast, I'm not sure what you're doing. Uh, please just let me know. Everybody okay with this? All right, so now what does that tell me? What does that tell me? I know that the slope is B over negative A. Well, that's why this was important. And I always try to tell kids, they never really give you just, you know, extra information. So A is equal to negative B, does everybody see that? Right, so where I see A, which I see A right here, I can replace A with what? So now I have the slope is B over negative negative B which is B over B, which is one. So it's telling me the slope is always what? Yes, it's always positive. But more importantly, the slope is always what? One also. They could have put one down. All right, that would be hard to see. So I know from the answers 
the correct answer then would have to be what? Would have to be A. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Now, again, remember what I'm saying. If please, everyone's in here for a reason. If I'm not clear, you got to raise your hand and say, whoa, tell me, slow down. All right. Nothing to be embarrassed about. All right. Nothing. All right. You, this is your course. All right. I want you to do better. So you got to speak up if I'm not, if you don't know something. All right. Here we go. Let's look at number two. All right. Now, number two, I always tell kids is an important question. All right. And generally, this type of question is on the test and most people struggle with it. All right. So now what I want to do is in the X, Y plane, the line determined by the points 2K and K32 passes through the origin. All right. Now, passing through the origin is super duper important. If it passes through the origin, what is the y-intercept? Well, keep in mind the origin is zero, zero, agreed? So the y-intercept is zero. Does everybody agree with that? So actually your equation is just y equals mx. Does everybody agree with that? Y equals mx. So that means the slope is always just what? Y over X. So I agree with that. Now, again, I thought this problem was really hard and it's really hard for most kids. But once you realize that the slope is always just Y over X, then what is two comma K? That slope is just going to be what? K over two. And what is this slope, slope gonna be? Someone tell me. Say it, come on. Yep, 32 over K, 32 over K. And what's true about both of those slopes? It has to be what? It has to be the same. Exactly. If two points are on the line, that slope is always gonna be the same, regardless of what you're looking at. Does that make sense, guys? So now those two slopes are equal. And so now we just have a proportion, do we agree? And when you cross multiply, you end up with K squared equals 64. So K equals what? K equals eight. How's that? Everybody good? All right. Now, what I'd like to do now is let's take a look at three and uh, I'm gonna give you, let's say 30 seconds. Well, I'll be nice, a minute. I want everybody to try number three. All right, I got it sitting down right now, timing you for one minute. And then we'll just answer the question, see how you're doing. And if you can do number three already, just jump down to number four, because that's coming next. All right, that's one minute. All right, guys, what are you thinking? Anybody confident in their answer here? What is it? I got a B so far, good. What else? Anybody? Oh, come on, no one's brave. Tell me, come on. D, I like it. Anybody else? All right, now I'm gonna do a couple techniques here with you, all right? I personally think you should never miss this problem. All right, because again, you can just plot points. Let me show you what I mean by that. Take a look here. All right, 
I'm going to just draw an X and Y axis. It passes through the origin. So everybody see this now. This is a really great technique. It passes through the origin. What's the slope? One seven. Does everybody remember that means you're going up one and to the right seven. Does everybody agree with that? So what I did was I just put this point right over here. I made this a one and this a seven. And then I just drew this line. Now, why didn't I go to the left? Because I didn't see any negatives. Does everybody agree with that? Now, take a look at that. Is it possible for zero seven to be on the graph? No, does everybody agree with me? Now again, look up on the board because I'm I love my iPad so I can help you visualize things. All right, so does everybody agree zero seven is not possible, right? So now one seven over one up seven. Is that possible? No. Seven seven, is that possible? Uh-oh, the only possible answer then is what? The only possible answer is D. All right, now again, listen to what I'm saying. How nice was that visually to be able to see how simple that problem was? Does everybody agree with me? All right, so that's one of the most important things I try to teach kids is if you don't know something, if you've had algebra two, you can figure out most of the problems. You can figure them out. You just have to learn to stop saying, I don't know how to do it, so therefore, I'm just guessing, all right? That's the one thing I can help you probably improve the most is your confidence. You can solve every problem if you've had algebra two, all right? There's a few trig that you might have trouble with, all right? But does everybody agree? Look how simple that was. Just by plotting the points, graphing, doing what it says, the only possible answer is what? 14.2, all right? Does anybody have any more questions about that? All right, let's jump to the next one. All right, here we go. Number four, I'd like to give you a minute to think about it. Have at it. Like I said, if you're done with number four, just go to number five. Okay, now let me just say this real quick. If you're struggling with lines, this is super duper important for you to pay attention to just ask me a question if you're not clear, all right? Everyone's had experience with lines since algebra one, geometry and algebra two, all right? So you should be pretty good at it, all right? Again, depending on how strong your teacher was, that's probably how strong you are, all right? So let's take a look now, all right, and see what it says. All right, a line shown in the XY plane above, a second line is parallel. So parallel just means what? Slopes are equal. So I agree with that. Slopes are equal. So that means the slope of the parallel line is gonna have the same slope, right? And here's how I like to teach kids. I draw this. Now, again, I'm zooming in. So you have to be with me now. Everybody see what I'm looking at? I teach kids this is delta y and this is delta x. Change in y over change in x. That's what slope is. All right. So in this case, I would want you to be able to tell me that your slope, how many did I go up? Three. How many did I go over? So everybody knows the slope has to be what? Three fourths. So that means the slope of the parallel line is three fourths. So then that is equal to this slope right here. I don't know why they chose C. It's kind of annoying, all right? But it doesn't matter, all right? We're just saying C minus 1 over 3 minus 1. So 3 fourths equals C minus 1 over 2. Is everybody good with that? 
Now, what I want to do is I really want to try to help you now with mental math and arithmetic, even though some of you are like, that's silly. All right, watch how I want you to do this. All right, does everybody agree we have a proportion, so we're cross multiplying. So I say four times C minus one equals six. Does everybody agree with that? Now, I don't want you to distribute. I just want you to divide. So C minus one equals six over four, right? But six over four reduces to what? Three over two, right? And then I do what? I add one. And one is the same as two over two. So I know my answer has to be five over two. All right, how's that guys? Where, where, okay, so let's go back. Did you see the cross multiplying? Are you okay with this? So cross multiplying, we're here. This times this, oh, yeah. Yeah. all right, equals this times this. Good? Yeah. Now, most teachers say distribute, right? And you can distribute if you want, but I'm saying you might as well just divide first, yeah. right? So I divided both sides by four. And six over four reduces to what? Three over two. Right. You agree with me? So now I'm at C minus one equals three over two. And then I just add one. Does that happen? You good down? Yeah. And one, of course, is the same as two over two. So C equals five over two. Thank you very much. All right. Remember, it's up to you guys. If I'm not clear, just tell me. All right. Everybody happy with that? All right. Let's try the next one. Give you a minute, see if you can think about it. Fifteen seconds. All right, let's see how we did here. All right. Now, again, there is a huge emphasis on lines. OK, so that's why we're going to spend some time. Make sure you're good. All right, here we go. So I have. The graph of the line passes through one four and crosses the x-axis at two zero. All right, so right off the bat, you should say I have an equation with two points. So if I have an equation with two points, everyone should be able to say, well, I can write the equation of that line, it's gonna be no problem. So in order to write the equation of line, I always need a point and a slope. So the first thing we're gonna do is calculate the slope. So M equals zero minus four, over two minus one. Is everybody happy with the slope being negative four? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, the next thing I want everybody to do is I want everybody to make sure they review point slope form. All right, you should know that pretty well. Y minus Y one equals M times X minus X one. Now, why do I say point slope form? Because if you know the point slope form, I have a point and a slope. So now I can write the equation really simply. All right. Now, the next thing is, does it matter if I select one, four, or does it matter if I select two, zero? Does it matter? No. Makes no difference, right? So you just pick a point, right? This is X one, this would be Y one, and we just plug it into the formula. So Y minus four, equals negative four times X minus one. So that's the equation. Everybody happy with that? But the problem is they want to know what the Y intercept is. So that means I'm just plugging what? Zero in for what value? X. Is everybody happy with that? 
So now I'm going to plug zero in for X. I'm going to change my color just so you can see. So now Y minus four equals negative four times zero minus one. And then I'm just solving that out. So Y minus four equals four. So Y equals eight, all right? Now, technically I could have put B in for Y, but does it really matter? It doesn't really matter, all right? So again, there we have it, all right? Now, remember your job right now, tell me if I'm not clear, is everybody okay with that? And if you can't read it, I, you know, I have lots of control over my screen. I can shrink it down, whatever. All right. Everybody happy with that so far? All right. That's a good start. All right. Lines, probably one of the most important topics. You got to be really good at it. All right. Here we go. Now, I really like number six. All right. Everybody's going to get this right because everybody can draw. All right. I want everybody to draw this out. You have to get it right. Believe it or not, most people miss this question, all right? Because they never think about drawing. So I want everybody to draw something. 30 seconds. All right, guys, who's confident? What's the answer? Slope is negative. Anybody else confident? Slope is negative. Only one? No, one brave soul. Just one. Oh, man. Are we, are we all just like, yeah, she's right, obviously. No, we're not obviously right. That's what, we're, that's what I was thinking. All right, so listen, draw a line that goes through quadrants two, three, and four. Now, some of you are like, man, I forgot which quadrants where, right? Okay, so, so if that's the case, we got a problem, right? So here's where we go. One, two, three, four. There's the quadrants. Now draw a line through those quadrants. And it has to enter two, three, and four. I have to eliminate one. So the best thing to think about is nothing over here. So no matter how hard I try, the graph has to look something like this, which means the slope is negative. Good job if you got that. Now, again, I'm trying to show you how drawing a picture is super helpful. It's just super helpful. I, I, when somebody said that to me, I was like, oh, well, obviously it's negative. No, it was not obvious. I had to draw it. All right, I had to draw it. All right, and you'll be surprised how much you can get right just by drawing things better. All right, here we go. Let's look at this guy right here, number seven. Now, believe it or not, most of my kids miss this too. All right, give you a minute to think about it. Five seconds. All right, here we go. Who's confident? Come on, someone else. Tell me. Oh, nobody, no one's brave. 
All right, here we go. Let's see if I can show you something. All right, here we go. Now, again, what I want to do is, um, <clears throat> while preparing to run a marathon, Amelia created a training schedule in which the distance of her longest run every week increased by a constant amount. So what I'm trying to remind you of, when somebody says mm -hmm. increase by a constant amount, that'd be like increase this week by two miles, next week, two miles, and then two more miles. You see what I'm saying, right? So get a picture of what they're asking you. Then it says that in week four, she did what? Eight miles. So right off the bat, look, guys, come on, look how easy. Four, eight. And then week 16 is 26. So 16 to 26, right? So I'm looking at this going, well, I have two points, right? Now I want everybody to do this for me so I can show you something I think is important. Miles each week, miles each week, all right? That's referring to a what? That's referring to a slope, right? 1.5 miles each week, that's a slope. Now, two miles every three weeks, all right? That's a slope also, all right? But what I'd like to do is, since they're talking about miles each week, I'm going to see how many miles did I increase every what? Every week. So I went from eight to 26. That means I increased by what? 18 miles. And then that took me how many weeks? 12 weeks. So I agree. So that means if I divide by six, that gives me three over two. So three divided by two is 1.5. So that means I increase by 1.5 miles every week. That's why the correct answer was D. All right. Everybody happy with that? All right. Again, uh, please, if, I, if, if I'm not clear, you just got to speak up. All right. Now, I feel like number eight is uh, very simple, but most people miss it. So we're just going to review. Listen, I want everybody to write down Y equals MX plus B. So the number in front is a slope, right? Which means that is a rate of change. So anybody says increase or decrease and it's a comparison you know they're talking about slope the b value is referred to as the y intercept now under y intercept i want you to write it is also the initial amount all right that's y equals b when x equals zero that's exactly what that means now that I've just kind of have that in your head, because I have that in your head, initial is super important. That's what the y-intercept is, the initial amount or the amount you start with. So now that you see that, they tried to trick you here by putting the 108 before the 23. The 23 represents the slope. Is everybody with me on that? And the 108 is the y-intercept. So now that we spoke about that, and you hopefully understand a little bit better, if you were to look at that, which one of those represents the y-intercept? Mm hmm because that's what they're asking about. 108 is the y-intercept. Tell me, sir. What do you think? Uh, I think B, it is absolutely B. Starts each week. Starts each week. That's an initial what? Initial amount problem. That's what we're talking about. So you see, I didn't have to do a whole lot of work there because I understand Y equals MX plus B and what it means. The slope is a rate of change. The Y intercept is the initial amount. All right, you can, you can improve your score tremendously just by understanding Y equals MX plus B. All right, everybody good with that? All right, nice. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, now, next one, if you paid attention, you should be able to read this one and just tell me the answer. 
All right, I want everybody to read it, giving you 30 seconds. And then without much thought, you should be able to tell me. I want to see how good I'm doing. All right. Someone tell me. Be brave without doing any work. Tell me. Is it A, beautiful? Why is it A? That is the rate of change. I couldn't have said it any better myself. 100% correct. Believe it or not, most people miss this question. Right? And I'm trying to tell you, if you understand Y equals MX plus B, this is not a problem. Right? Because they asked what? What is the estimated increase of the boy's height each year? Height each year is referring to the slope. So the slope has to be what? Three. You've gotten so much better already if you're paying attention and listen to exactly what I'm trying to tell you. There's no math in a lot of these problems. You have to understand concepts. All right. Please take note of that. And if you're like, man, that guy's crazy. I have no idea what he's talking about. You're supposed to raise your hand and say, help me out a little bit. Yeah, I'm not asking you to know it. All right. I want you to understand what I'm saying. So if you don't understand, I can, I can rephrase it. Anybody have any issues with that? See how powerful that is just by knowing Y equals MX plus B and what it means. All right. Everybody's good. And I always tell kids, if you know that, that's less time on this problem and more time on the harder problems. That's why it's important to know that information. All right, here we go. Number 10, same principle, same principle. All right, let's see if you can identify, see if you can pull it out. All right, give you a couple minutes, not a couple minutes, but a couple seconds. Read it through. All right, come on now, guys. A, B, C, D, come on, let's go. Be brave now. It doesn't matter if you're wrong. What do we got? Somebody tell me what they're thinking. A, anybody else? A, 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 now you're starting to see what I'm talking about, right? This 12 is a rate. It's simply what? $12 per hour, right? Because in is the number of landscapers and H is the number of hours you're going to work. Is everybody with me on that? All right. Again, that's just me because I know what, I know what Y equals MX plus B is. All right. Is everybody happy with that explanation? All right. Now, hopefully you feel a lot better already about understanding lines and what they're representing. All right. In word problems. Cause I've dealt with lots of kids. They know slope, but they don't know the interpretation of slope. All right, so hopefully you feel much better about that now. All right. Now, um, again, I really like number 11 because it's solving for a particular variable, and that's something kids are miserable at too. All right. And I'm going to show you the mental math and the mental exercise that will help you be better at that also. So I'd like everybody to try number 11. Like I said, I don't mean to be pushy, but a minute is a good time frame. If you don't know something, you're not going to know how to do it, and then we can just go over it. So everybody try number 11. I've got my clock going for a minute.
Okay. Now, why this problem is, is really important is because I want to teach kids generally when they give you a point, CD is a point, that means you have to do what? Plug it in. That's what that means. All right. So my equation again is Y equals KX plus four, D equals K times C plus four. Is everybody good with that? I just plugged it in. Everybody happy with that? And now it's just a matter of what is the slope? Now, the slope in this case, I think is kind of silly. They're just always trying to throw you off, but K is the slope. So I'm literally just solving for K. So that means I move the four to the left. Does everybody agree with that? When I move the four to the left, it becomes negative. And then I have to divide by C. There you have it. D minus four over C. All right. Anybody have any questions with that? So again, if you're not 100% sure, when they give you a point, most of the time, plug the point in. Yes, sir. Do, do we have the slope? No, no, listen, I'm just telling you how my thought process works. There's always different ways to do things. You with me? My way is not the only way for sure. Generally, I try to tell kids my way is the best way because I've done it thousands of times, right? And I've come up with all the different possibilities. But no, you're allowed to think differently and you're allowed to get the, the same answer with different method. All right. I'm just trying to tell you how I would want you to think logically through the problem. That's all. All right. And if you come up with a different idea or a better idea, that's how I learned a lot. Listen to kids. All right. So feel free to jump in if you have a different way. All right. Now, um, this one I just want to briefly touch on right here. And we're not even going to do it. We're going to do it together because I think it's really dumb. All right. And the reason why I say it's really dumb is because I missed this problem. Right. I know how to do slope. All right. I'm trying to tell everybody, listen to me now. You're going to know how to do the problems. You're going to think you're right and you're still going to miss it. All right. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow up on this line right here. Everybody look at me blowing up. Everybody look at it and tell me what the slope is. Everybody write, tell me the slope again. Say it again. I'm proud of you. Slope is three-fourths. You're nice and brave. And obviously that's going to be what? That's going to be wrong. Right? Because why? Because that's what I put too. All right? Because I thought I was so smart. I didn't put much time into it. I just said three-fourths. Now, please look up here on the board so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. I got it wrong and I just smacked myself because I'm never going to do, I'm never going to get this problem wrong again, ever. All right. What's the problem with the slope being three fourths? And this is what they do always on the SAT test. They mess with the scales. Uh, Isn't that annoying? Yeah. What is the slope? Uh, Help her out. What is the slope? Yes, I definitely went up three. But how many did I go over? One. One. Now, you see what I'm trying to tell you guys, and I'm, I'm being honest with you. The first time I took this test, I missed the problem. Right? Isn't that, does everybody agree with me? That's dumb. Right? I, that doesn't tell me what you know about math. That's just ha-ha. I pulled a fast one on you. Right? They're laughing at you. All right? Everybody knows that's three over one. It's not three over four. Right, does everybody understand what I'm saying about mess the scale? Right, because the distance from here to here looks like four, but it's really only one because here it's telling me from zero to one. All right, that's why I say the SAT is a detail test. If you're not good at details, you're gonna stay at a 600. If you can learn to improve on the details, you can get to 700 without much thought. Honestly, I don't have to teach you any more math. It's just garbage like that, all right? That is always on the test, all right? You have to be careful when selecting the answers, all right? And I'll show you that over and over and over again. You're going to know how to do it, all right? Here we go. Let's see if the next one's fun. Yeah, so this answer was not three over four, but it was three, all right? 12 was C. All right, 
Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to just take a quick look at 13. This is just write the equation of the line and then find f of 3. All right. So again, this you should be good at now. Find the slope, put it in point slope, and then plug in for 3. All right. Let's see if you can do that. One minute. All right. If you can do that, you're in great shape. Okay, here we go. Now, again, in my humble opinion, here's how you should write the equation of line. First thing is you have to find the slope. So M equals, now does it matter what two points you pick? No, so I'm just picking these two points. So four minus negative two over two minus zero. Did anybody else get six over two, which is three, right? Anybody else get the slope is three? Now, I want everybody to highlight this for me or circle this. This automatically right here is the what? The y-intercept. So the problem was much easier if you understand that. So what does that mean? Y equals 3x minus 2. Did everybody see that? And now all I do is plug 3 in for x. So y equals 9 minus 2, 7. All right, how's that, guys? All right, again, let me tell you something. Writing the equation of the line, whether it's parallel, whether it's perpendicular, super duper important. You have to know how to write the equation of the line. All right. Anybody want me to go into any more details on that problem? All right, that's really good if you know that. Master of the line, okay? Here we go, let's have some more fun with the next one. All right, now this one, what I wanna do is we're just gonna do this one together. All right, and I want you to hear my brain, what it's saying, all right? Because again, you don't know how to have to do, know how to do this problem. All right, this was very hard for most kids. All right, but what I want you to do is I'm trying to let you hear what I'm saying and I'm gonna teach you how I'm doing this on my paper. All right, so as I'm reading this, oil gas production in a certain area dropped from 4 million to 1.9 million. Assuming that the oil and gas production decreased at a constant rate, which of the following best models the population of millions of barrels two years after 2000? All right, so first of all, was it increasing or decreasing? How much? Decreasing. So everybody should look at this and say, okay, it's decreasing. So I know it's not A and I know it's not B because that slope is positive, which means that it must have been what? Increasing. We want it what? Decreasing. Now, most kids said, I have no idea how they got a 21. So then what they did was they said, okay, I see a 1.9. So I see a 19, so I'm going to go ahead and pick D. Now, listen to what I'm saying. If that's your thought process, generally, the obvious answer to me is not the correct answer. So if I was guessing and had no idea how to do this problem, I would have probably crossed out D because that's the one they want me to choose. Does everybody understand that? Now, obviously, that technique doesn't always work. Is everybody with me? But that would work in this case because they want you to say D, so we know the answer is what? C. Now the question is, okay, let's just do the math. So I went from four to 1.9.
from four to 1.9 is going down 2.1 million barrels over a what? Over a 13 year period. That's how they got that. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't know how they got 21 over 130. All right, so basic arithmetic now, not insulting, but just saying, I multiply the top by 10, multiply the bottom by 10, 21 over 130 negative. Is everybody happy with that explanation now? Again, that's a super duper important problem. All right, and I really wanted you to hear my thought process on how I knew the answer couldn't be A or B. So now I've got it narrowed down to 50% chance. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I always tell kids this, when they give me a new SAT, I know every single problem except probably three. And then I can just know I have the ability to what? Figure the three that I don't know out, all right? Using techniques and strategies, all right? So that's what I want you to be able to do. And this was a great strategy. If I don't know, I've narrowed it down to what? 50-50 chance and move on from there, all right? So that's really, really, really important, all right? So here we go. Let's check out the next problem. Now, the next obviously super duper important is linear equations or, or systems of equations, sorry. All right, everybody should be a master of the systems of equations. I'm gonna show you some cool things on your calculator. If you brought your calculator, I'm a master of the calculator. I'm gonna show you how you can do that also. It's really cool and really fast, all right? So here we go. What is the solution? Now, please look, everybody look up at me because I'm going to show you. I know you know how to solve a system of equation. I'm just going to show you how to effectively do it. All right. So you do it the fastest possible way. I want everybody to highlight the X's. Are the X's all different? Yes. Then you should look at the Y values. Are the Y values all different? No. no. They're not. So I should solve for X. That way I don't have to figure out what Y is. Does everybody agree with me? So that's a number one tip right there. Timing is the most important uh, commodity you have. All right, you wanna try to think quickly. All right, so does everybody understand my strategy right off the bat? All right, I want to eliminate the Y. If I eliminate the Y, then I know what the answer is. So I want everybody to take a look at this. And if I'm eliminating the Y, that means I'm just multiplying the second equation by what? Somebody said two, anybody else? Wouldn't we, be, wouldn't we be multiplying by four? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. That's my mistake. And again, they almost tricked me. Look at this, three X plus four Y equals negative 23. I didn't even think they wrote it out of order. So you are 100% correct. Negative X plus two Y equals negative 19. Does everybody see that? All right, I'm glad I made that mistake. Does everybody see that now? All right, they wrote it out of order, which was kind of annoying. I didn't even, didn't even think about it. All right, so now somebody said multiply by two, but really am I gonna multiply by two or by what? Thank you very much. I'm gonna multiply by negative two. All right, is everybody happy with that? Systems of equations, right? So when I multiply by negative two, this becomes two X minus four Y, equals 38. Everybody agreeing? All right, now I don't wanna make a mistake, so I'm gonna rewrite it. 3X plus 4Y equals negative 23. 2X minus 4Y equals 38. Now we just add them together. 5X equals 15. So X equals three. And so that's my answer, B. Now, please tell me if you say, I it's been a while since I've had to do a system of equation. Can you slow down? I'll be happy to re-explain something. Listen, guys, systems of equations, almost as important as lines. All right, does anybody need me to review that? Everybody's happy with that? All right, let's go on to the next one then. All right. Now, in the equation above, all right, beef and chicken. All right, then it says, what was the price per pound of beef when it was equal to the price per pound of chicken? 
so beef and chicken are equal, right? So everybody should be able to just say, well then, 1.75 plus 0.4 X equals 2.35 plus 0.25 X. Everybody okay with that? They tried to throw you off because B and C, all right? But beef and chicken, they're equal. Set them equal to each other. All right, now of course it's obnoxious because we have decimals and most kids are uncomfortable with decimals. So I always tell kids, think of this as 40 cents minus 25 cents. 40 cents minus 25 cents to me is 15 cents. And then 235 minus $1.75. To me, that was 60 cents. And now, of course, if I divide, how many 15 cents is in 60 cents? Four. Four. I'm happy with that. So X is four. But they want to know the price. So now I just plug four in, right? Now, please look, because I think this is important. Is it better to plug four in to chicken or four in to beef? I would say it's easier to plug it into beef because I know four quarters make a... Is everything on? Yes, we're good. If I plug four quarters, that makes a dollar. Does everybody agree with that? And then a dollar plus 235 is 335. Everybody happy with that explanation? Everybody's good? All right, I like that. All right, now, um, I hope everybody brought a calculator, all right? If you brought a calculator, I'm gonna to try to show you something that's very beneficial, all right? If you didn't bring a calculator, um, did anybody not bring a calculator? And it's okay if you didn't. So what I do is I have one extra one right here, all right? What I'd like you guys to do is you guys can kind of share a little bit. Um, if I had another one, I'd be happy to, but um, I'll let you use this. I think I can talk you through it. So here is your graphic. Help you guys kind of if you don't mind. You guys can mm -hmm. share it. And so again, um, to me, the calculator is super duper powerful. Super duper powerful. All right. So some teachers I get mad at because they don't want you to use the calculator. All right, which I think is really dumb. My seventh and eighth graders use the graphing calculators all the time. All right, and partly it's because it's technology, right? You're supposed to be good at technology. And most kids have these powerful calculators they don't know how to use them. So my job right now is to try to show you how cool the calculator can be. If you don't know, all right, like I said, I'm recording the class. You can go back when you get home and kind of go to this problem and kind of listen to it again. But I'll try to write things out for you also. All right, so first and foremost on this, all right, I always use the calculator, right? Because the calculator is always gonna be correct as long as I put in correct information, all right? So a food truck sell, sells salads, so immediately I just put an X over salad and drinks I put as Y. I don't use any other variable except X and Y, all right? So now here's where I need your attention. All right, so I sold 209 salads and drinks. So I want everybody to write X plus Y equals 209. So I grew that. And then the salads cost 650. So I just did 6.5 X plus two Y equals 836.50. Now, if you're like, man, I don't know what you're doing. Just please tell me. All right, let me, let me help you draw, write that out. I don't think that's too difficult, right? We first started doing this in algebra one. You've had algebra two, so you redid it in algebra two. So I feel like we should be okay with that. But don't be afraid. If you're not sure, you tell me, right? Is everybody comfortable with those two equations? Now I'm gonna show you something super duper powerful on your calculator. I would never solve that by hand because the numbers are just too big, right? So please, everybody watch up here on the board now and you can see how super cool it is, all right? First of all, we have to put everything in terms of Y equals, all right? So the first one, does everybody agree, is just, and I'm gonna put Y1 equals 209 minus X. Is everybody happy with that? Then under Y2, 
equals. Now here's where I want you to be smart. Please look up here so I can show you. I make all of my Algebra 1 kids know this. You have to solve for Y quickly. So to do that, it's 836.5 minus 6.5 X, close parentheses, divided by two. Now, if you don't know that, please don't, don't hesitate, right? I'm solving for Y, so I'm moving the X. When I move the X, it becomes negative, and then I divide by whatever's in front of the Y. Is everybody comfortable with that? Now, if you're gonna do it on your calculator, remember it does order of operation, that's why I had to put in the what? Parentheses. So now everybody go to Y1 for me on the calculator and type in 209 minus X. Um, it's the top left, Y equals. And then everybody's typing in 209 minus X. Does everybody know where the X is? It's not the alpha, it's the X and then theta and then T and then N. There's that button right in the middle. All right, if you need me to come show you, I can do that. All right, then under Y2, type it in just like that, please. Type it in just like that. All right, and once you have that typed in exactly correctly, you good? Yeah. All right, here we go. Now the beauty of your calculator, all right? Now, does everybody understand our answers? All right, well, first of all, everybody just hit graph. And you're gonna go, this guy's crazy. Nothing's on my screen, right? Right, there's nothing on your screen because the graphs are outside the window. So now let me show you the beauty of the calculators. Everybody ready? All right, look at your answers. My biggest answer is 105, is everybody with me? So I need everybody to go to window. If I hit window and I wanna change the X maximum to 110. 110, X max to 110, X max to 110. If you don't know what I'm saying, you let me know. Yep, is everybody good? All right, now here's the beauty of it. I want everybody to hit zoom and then zero. And it is going to fit the line, all right? It's gonna fit the line on your, uh, in your window so you can see the point of intersection. All right. Now, it looks like the point of intersection I didn't really like. Uh, I don't really like the 110. Now here, let me just, I just know some yours. So, uh, 209 minus X. Okay, 836 minus 6.5 X divided by six. Oh, we got it. Yeah, it's, it's divided by that's fine. All right. So, does everybody see? And then, once you have that, now, does everybody have the intersection? Graph it on your calculator. And now what I want you to do is you can calculate the point of intersection. Now, now do you understand we're trying to calculate the point of intersection? So now we go to second calc which is above the trace button, and then intersection five, and then hit enter, enter, enter. Yep, yep, here we go. Second, and then the calc, calculate the point of intersection, number five, hit enter, and then enter right here. That's right, and then enter three times. Again, again, and there it is, there's the answer. So the cool? second calc is what? Five, yeah, yeah. it's the intersection. Yeah. Then, and, okay, it's too long. So we're going to 
to the uh, track. All right, does everybody know how to use the calculator for the intersection? All right, does everybody see the point? Did everybody see how cool that was that you don't have to use your, uh, the, the math? Did you get your answer? Girls, you good now? Does that make sense? All right. So again, super duper powerful. To be able to find the point of intersection on your calculator is absolutely one of the most amazing things you can do. All right. And I think the correct answer was what, guys? Help me out. 93, right? All right. So I'm pretty happy with that. All right. Now, does anybody have any, does anybody need me to show you something? All right. Now, uh, we're going to do another one. But what I want to do now is I want to show you this. If you have problems with the calculator, all right, I want everybody to hit Zoom. Everybody hit the Zoom button again. Now, does everybody go understand standard? Go to Zoom standard, and then it turns it back into a 10 by 10 screen. All right, so you're back to normal. Because sometimes if it's not normal, people get freaked out. Don't ever be freaked out. Just go Zoom standard. It puts it back to 10 by 10. Is everybody good with that? All right, so because of that, we're now going to have some more fun. Just to double check, we're going to do number 18 on the calculator. All right. So the first thing I'm, we're just going to read it together because I don't think it's a problem. Then we're going to practice with the calculator. All right. So it says uh, a group of 202 people went on an overnight camping trip, taking 60 tents. So there are two types of tents. So I'd like everybody to put X plus Y equals 60 down. And then there were two people tents, which is 2x, and four-person tents, which would be 4y. And that totaled what? 202 people. Is everybody okay with that? All right. And now we're going to just practice solving for y. So under y1, we would type in what? Thank you for participating. And then Y2, we would have what? Come on, guys, help me. Y2 would be 202 minus right. Don't forget the X, right? Minus 2X, put it in parentheses, and then divide it by four. Look how cool that is. All right? Then look at my window. The largest number is what? 30, right? So go to your window and change the X max to probably 40. And then zoom zero. And then second calc five. Then you hit enter three times. And it will tell you the answer. Now we want the two person tent. So you got to make your note, two person is the X coordinate. All right, now I really would like to walk around the room because I don't, I don't want you to feel bad. I want you to tell me if, if I'm not clear. All right, and if you're like, wow, this is really good, then I'm in good shape, all right? If you don't know something, you can ask me. All right, here we go. You're getting there? All right, how are you doing? You okay with that? You good? You good with that? You good? Figure it out? Figure it out. You got it. You got it. Good. All right. Let me get that. Now, what zoom zero is, it's zoom fit, which just basically means it's taking the information that's in the domain, transferring the range to fit the domain. And then you can see the point of intersection nice and clear. All right. So hopefully you guys feel good about that. Now, I'd also like to say that brings us to about an hour and 20 minutes into the course, all right, which remember there are what, four big lessons, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll through here, and I'm going to pick off one or two that I think are super important. This is the biggest one, in my opinion. That's why I spend a little bit more time, all right, and then the others, I don't need to spend as much time, but this is the biggest part, all right. So what I want to do now is I just want to scroll down and I want to tell you which ones I feel like are extremely important. Um, okay, uh, number 19, you should be able to do on your own now because we just did two more examples. Now, number 20 is super important. So we're just going to go ahead and do number 20 together. And I'd like for you to 
Just please listen. This 100% I know is on the test every single time. All right. They do this kind of stuff. All right. Very, very important. All right. And everybody's attention now on number 20. All right. So now, uh, in the system of equations above, the system has infinitely many solutions. If it has infinitely many solutions, that just means it's the same exact what? Same exact line, right? So just review. This, this has no solution because they're parallel. This and this has one solution. And then this and this has infinitely many solutions because it's the same line. Does everybody agree with me? All right. So if it's the same line, does everybody agree the slope is going to be the same? So that's what I'm getting at. Look right here, guys. Let's solve this for the slope. I think this is the easiest way to do it. So again, this right here, the slopes are going to be the same. So can everybody look at this part right here and know I'm moving the 2x over? So it's going to be 8y equals negative 2x plus 60. And then I divide by eight. So the slope of that line is negative one fourth. Is everybody okay with that? That's gonna be the same as this slope up here. So if I move the A over, I'm going to get BY equals negative AX plus 12. Then I would divide by B, Y equals negative AB over X plus 12 over B. That's the slope. So negative one fourth equals negative A over B. Again, this one's kind of hard. So I'm gonna, I just rush through it and then I'm gonna review it with you. So does everybody agree the two negatives don't matter? So A over B equals one fourth. Everybody okay with that? And there, that's what they're asking. What's A over B? So A over B is in fact what? One fourth. All right, again, I just know for certainty that's on the test. They always ask infinitely many solutions. All right, so now because I just gave you an example, no solution, look on 21. No solution means that the lines are what? Parallel. Parallel, which means again, the slopes are what? The same. the same. So I want everybody, please look at the mental math. We're gonna practice mental math. Everybody look up here on the board. I make all of my algebra one kids be able to look at that and tell me what the slope is. Now, please look, I always want the Y to be positive. So I'm moving this over. And then I divide by five. So I would like everybody to be able to say, yes, I can see the slope is four fifths. Mm -hmm. If you can't, I need to explain it one more time. Does everybody, can everybody look at that and say, I know the slope is four fifths. Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay with that? I know the slope is four fifths. That's a powerful thing if you can do that. Just saves a tremendous amount of time. So the slope is four fifths. That means the slope of this line has to be what? Four fifths. So put four fifths equals, now I'm moving the three Y over and then I'm dividing by three. So the slope of this line is K over three. Is everybody okay with that? So now the slopes have to be equal. So to solve this, I just multiply both sides by three. So K equals again, fractions. If you're like, man, I'm horrible at fractions. I can teach you that real quick too. Multiply, just make it over one. So that's 12 over five. Is everybody happy with that explanation? So look how easy, 12 over five, A. Easy, easy, easy. All right, not really easy, actually. That's very hard. All right. All right, let's flip the page a little bit. Oh, man. I could just have so much fun with these problems. I'm going to do one more for number 22. All right, and I said something earlier in the day about when you see a point, what should you do to the point? Plug it in. All right, everybody listen to what I just said. Apply what I just said to this problem. And everybody's gonna get this problem right. If you don't apply that to this problem, it's hard to do. 
whenever they give you a point, I said to plug the point in and it'll answer the question most of the time. And when you think you know, tell me. Are anybody confident? It's hard. What is it? B so far? Tell me. A, good. A. All right, now listen, on your paper, I said plug the point in. So everybody should be plugging zero, zero in, correct? So zero is greater than zero plus A, which just means zero is less than A. Everybody agree with that? Now I'm plugging zero, zero in. Zero is less than zero, I said less than, but greater than zero plus B. And so zero is greater than B. Now you always should do the variable first. All right? So if we were looking at this, we would say that A is greater than zero and B is what? Less than zero. Does everybody read that? Anybody have any questions with that? So if A is greater than zero and B is less than zero, obviously then A has to be greater than B. All right, that's really nice, really nice. Okay, now um, again, 23, we've done something like that. 24, plug in the point. Oh, wow, so I'm on pretty good shape, guys. All right, I'm feeling really good about this. All right, so I spent a little bit of extra time, but I feel like these are important. Now look, additional practice. This is called heart of algebra, all right? So 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, we gave you some practice problems here. And then guess what we did? At the end, I want everybody to take a look at this. We have the solutions for you. So these are things that you can try on your own. All right, those are the things you can try on your own for a little bit of extra practice. All right, is everybody with me on that? Now, again, I think it's kind of important now, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my meeting here, pause. Now, again, uh, Passport to Advanced Math um, is kind of the next big section. All right. And generally, there are 16 questions. And we've kind of broken it down into these types of questions where they talk about exponential notation, exponential rules, polynomials. Um, now I can honestly say quadratic equation is just as important as lines, all right? So we took the time to go ahead and show you the three forms that come up, all right? Standard form, factored form, and vertex form. And I'll be explaining these because we have examples of those, all right? So if you're unfamiliar, like, oh my gosh, that was forever ago, that's okay, all right? I'll show you. Um, and then the next thing, which we found out to be really helpful, if you can remember, a lot of times they ask for the vertex and the vertex is just negative B over 2A, all right? That's helpful. And then solving quadratics by graphing, by factoring, completing the square, quadratic formula, you should review all that. You should be somewhat familiar with that. Um, now, does anybody remember, this is something I wanna go ahead and just have you write down real quick. The discriminant was underneath the radical in the quadratic formula, which was b squared minus 4ac. All right, if that's greater than zero, we say there are two solutions. And if b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero, we say it's one solution. And if b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, we say there are zero solutions. All right, so that's the one thing I think that's kind of important for you to know for the SAT. Everybody good with that? All right. Now I feel like anything else, I feel like it's just better just to jump into the questions. All right. So here we go. 
Let's take a look. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is 34 and 35 are the same. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do number 34. And then I want you to apply that to number 35. All right. And, and again, I'm trying to also show you how the SAT test is so repetitive, right? If you practice enough problems, you'll see the same problems. All right. Just different numbers. That's all. All right. So what am I trying to tell you up here? I need everybody to listen to me now. If the equation is true for all values of X, that means everything over here is equal to everything over here. That's what that means. What is the value of B? So now I want everybody to make a note to themselves. B is referring to the number in front of the X. Do I care about the X squared? Do I care about the constant? No. That means I don't care about anything that's related to X squared, and I don't think, care about anything that's referring to a number. I only care about the X values. Now, if you know that, look how much easier this problem is. If I do 2X times 3X, do I care what that is? No, because that's gonna be an X squared. So now what's 2X times five? 10X. What's three times 3X? plus nine X. Do I care what three times five is? No, cause that's the constant. So 10 X plus nine X must equal BX. So 19 X equals BX. So B must be what? 19. I do not understand the problem with these. And they put them on there all the time because they know kids just for whatever reason, that's a difficult concept. Now, again, hopefully you're not sitting there going, well, that was, I have no idea what you're doing. Then you would ask me, or because when I say it's simple, it's not simple if you don't understand, right? But as soon as you understand it, you'll see why I'm saying it's simple, all right? So if you're not understanding, you, your job right now is say, I don't know what you mean. All right, is everybody good with that? All right, so if you understand that, we're now going to apply it to this right here. Same problem. All right, same problem. I want everybody to tell me what B is. You got one minute. Everybody tell me what B is. I got my timer on. Should be done. It's just mental math. All right, now, now listen to what I'm saying, guys. Again, and, and, and it, does anybody, I hope everybody understands what I'm saying. It's not simple if you don't know how to do it. But you're not helping yourself if you don't say it, man, I just don't know what you're saying. All right, I want to help you. All right, so please, does everybody agree? I'm looking for the X value, right? That's all I'm looking for. Here's what? Here's 5X. And then I only care about negative two times negative two X. So I'm asking you, that's five X plus four X. What is that? Yeah, so B equals nine. Does everybody see what I'm saying? I don't, and I see kids all the time think they're smart. They're distributing and combining terms and they've just wasted a minute. You don't have time to waste. And I always tell kids, you wanna be accurate and quick but you don't wanna be so quick that you make a bunch of mistakes either. All right, cause that's defeats the whole purpose. Now, remember you would tell me if you're not sure about something. All right, is everybody comfortable with that just should be known, B equals nine. All right, now number 36, we're gonna work on just because everybody misses this problem and, and I just don't understand it. All right, so everybody take a look at 36. You got one minute, process of elimination. All right, tell me the answer. All right, guys, the only possible answer is what? A. Is everybody okay? The only possible answer is A. Right now, let me, let me just look. Let me just explain something. Does everybody agree I'm looking for 9A to the fourth, right? Three squared, is that nine? 
a squared squared, that's a to the fourth. So that's a possibility. Three to the fourth, is that nine? No, nine squared, that's not nine. Nine to the fourth. And I tell kids all the time, I just don't understand, right? Something as simple as that, all right? I'm not asking you to factor that, even though that's not that difficult of a thing. Now, does everybody understand what I'm saying? There's no reason to try to factor that. It's just be smart. Look at the answers and work backwards. That, to me, changed all standardized tests. It's easier to look at the answers to come up with the solution. Is everybody happy with that explanation? All right, super duper easy. All right, let's go on. 37. Now, this is something I as kids sit and stare all the time, and I just, like I said, I don't understand this one. Everybody do 37. Let's see if you understand what I mean. All right, obvious answer, what? Yeah, it's two, all right? Because look, if I let P equal two and two here, two times two is the what? Four. If I let it be three, three times three is not four. Four times four is not four. Nine times nine is not four. Does everybody understand that? And again, I, I, I'm, I'm puzzled by the difficulty that I see when kids are trying this problem because they're focused on, I'm not even sure what. All right, so I'm trying to teach you, looking at the answers is super duper helpful. And most kids that are good at math, they don't wanna work backwards. They wanna do and, and solve the algorithm to solve the problem. That's not the case on the SAT. Sometimes it's easier just take the answers, look at the answers and work backwards. Everybody with me on that? All right, hopefully you feel good about that. Now I'm gonna take some time on number 38 because this is on the test and almost everyone misses this. So listen, what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna give you time to work on this. I just want you to look up here and follow my explanation. All right, because when I did this problem right here, equivalent means that they're equal. Does everybody agree with that? So now I love my iPad because I can do some cool things. Copy, paste, and then I can put equals, equals, equals. And I'm just trying to show you how it's nice when I can do this because it, for me, it helps kids understand better that equivalent means they're what? They're equal, right? Now, I can look at this without hesitation and say, well, I know it's not A or B. I don't even have to think about it. Now, how do I know it's not A or B? Because if you're looking at this, you would be able to factor a 2x, and this would be 2x plus 3, and 2 parentheses 2x plus 1. Does that cancel out? Does that reduce? I mean, I can cross out the 2, but does it divide evenly? Does everybody understand what I'm saying, right? It does not divide evenly. So I knew the answer wasn't what? I knew it wasn't A or B right off the bat because it did not divide evenly. Now, a lot of kids don't understand what I'm saying because they have a problem with fractions. So if you're not understanding, please tell me now. Everybody's good on that? All right. So I know it's not A and B. Now, does everybody agree they're equivalents? That means if I let X equal zero, I'm going to get the same answer for the first fraction as I do for the second fraction. So now I'm going to plug zero in. If I plug zero in, I get zero minus two over two. And if I plug zero on the other side, I get zero over two. Well, are those two things equal? No, I don't think they're equal. Do you agree with that? So C cannot be the answer. So I knew quickly that the answer had to be what? Had to be D. Now I'm just gonna test it. 
So I'm plugging zero in, one minus two over two, does that equal zero over two? Well, two divided by two is one. So I knew the answer was D. So anytime they say equivalent and you're given fractions, you can plug in any number and both the fractions should equal the same thing. All right, does everybody agree with that? All right, hopefully that helps. All right, that one was a really hard problem for kids. Really, really hard. All right, now 39. All right, now listen, I'm not gonna give you an opportunity to solve this because a lot of people looked at this and say it was the systems of equations. They tried to solve it. Look, please look up. I wanna show you something. It is not a system of equation. Everyone should be able to look at that and say, obviously the answer is 26, obviously. There's, you just look at that and everyone says it's 26, right? Everybody can see that. You're supposed to say, no, I can't. That's, how does anybody see that? Who can tell me why it's 26? All right, it's not hard to see, is it? Tell me why, go. Something like that. Tell me why. I don't know, but that's what you did. You just multiplied 13 times two to get 26. Now, how would I know to do that? Why didn't we just add them or do something else, right? Now, look, here's, uh, these I tell kids are old school SAT questions, all right? But they're putting them on more and more on the test. Look, underline this and underline this. That's hidden in the solution. When somebody said to me, X squared minus Y squared, I don't even think X squared minus Y squared. I think that's X plus Y times X minus Y. Isn't that annoying? Did I see that now? Right, I'm saying one more time. X squared minus Y squared can factor into that. I'm pretty sure everybody in here knows that. I'm pretty sure. Now do you see why it's just multiplying two times 13? Because X plus Y is what? 13 and X minus Y is two. Isn't that super annoying problem? So these are the types of things I tell kids right before you take the test to flip through your notes and kind of find these little tricky questions that if you can review right before the test, you'll be able to maybe to apply them when you're taking the test. And like I said, that took me five seconds when I looked at it and just said, I knew it's 26 because I'm trained to look at X squared minus Y squared a little bit differently. Does everybody agree with that? All right, that's a really good point. Make yourself a good note on that. All right. Now, again, um, I'm going to emphasize number 40 again. All right. Number 40 is really hard, actually, for kids. All right. So I'm just going to walk you through my thought process here. All right. You can read it. But again, I know how hard it is. All right. I know how hard it is. But I'm going to show you that it's not really hard. It's really kind of what? really kind of easy. All right. Now, the first thing I want to remind you is, do we agree that everything over here has to equal everything over here? All right. So now I'm going to ask a question. Come on now. Everybody's got to look up and I want you to participate, please. I want everyone to tell me quickly what A has to be. A has to be this. What's A? Yeah, that's why this was hard. Good. Say it. 12? 20? I said four. Four. Now, I like what you said, right? Because we know that the X cubed terms have to be 20. We know that the X cubed terms have to be 20. Does everybody agree with that? There's only one way to make an X cubed. And that's if I multiply this times, uh-oh, this times this. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. That's how you knew it was four. Brilliant. Does everybody see what I'm saying now? I know A has to be four because there's only one X cubed term up here. So I want everybody to write down A equals four. And then you would raise your hand if you don't know what I'm saying. Please, anybody have any problems with that A being four? 
All right, so now watch me. So now I know 4x plus 3 times 5x squared minus bx plus 4 has to equal all this other garbage over here. Everybody happy with that? Now, we know that A is four. So I could probably confidently say, I don't think it's gonna be A because four times a fraction or a decimal would have to be 18. So if I was guessing, I'd probably say it's not that. Okay, does everybody agree? I'm, I'm hunting for B now, right? So B, is right here. That's the X term, right? So all of the X's have to add up to what? Somebody tell me what all the X's have to add up to, even though I wrote it wrong. All the X's have to add up to what? Help me guys, negative two. Does everybody agree with that? So far so good? What do all the x squareds have to add up to? Negative what? All right, I'm not doing a very good job. This right here are all the x squareds. Does everybody agree? They have to add up to what? They have to add up to negative 9. All of the x's have to add up to what? Negative 2. So you have a choice. Do you want to find the x's or do you want to find the x squareds? I don't think it matters. Let's go with the X's. All right, so now watch me. Again, this is hard, so that's what I'm saying. Please speak up when, when you get lost. Three times five X squared is an X squared term. Do I care about the X squared? Nope. Three times this, is that gonna give me an X? So negative three BX. Now, what's the other way I can make an X? Four times four X, what's that? 16 X. That has to equal what? Negative two X. All right, now again, guys, I, I know that's hard. All right, so I really don't want anybody sitting there afraid to ask me something. Okay, so let's look. I'm going to erase this so I can do a better job. So this, please watch me. This times this is 16x. This times this is negative 3bx. That's the only way I can make x values. Is everybody good with this? And so those have to add up to what? negative two. So now I'm going to divide everything through by X. Divide by X, divide by X, divide by X. Negative 3B plus 16 equals negative two. And I feel pretty good. Everybody can solve that. Negative 3B equals negative 18. B equals six. And we already said that A was what? Four. And the question is, what's A times B? 24. Now, please put a star by that one. And, and I really wish you would review that before you take your test because they always are asking about constants. And that's really hard for kids. Really, really hard. All right. So I want to try to find another one. Um, now it looks like, okay, they don't really have another example like that. All right. I wish they had another one. All right. But now, the next part, we're getting into quadratics and graphing. All right, so again, I feel like this is a weakness for kids. And I can make it a strength real quick, but you gotta just tell me when, you get, when you're not sure about something. All right, they're just forms. If you don't memorize the forms, I can't really help you. If you know the forms, it's easy. All right, so let's take a look now. Okay, there's the graph of the quadratic. Now I want everybody to write this down. It wants the vertex. So if you know the vertex form, which is this format, y equals a parentheses x minus h squared plus k. 
that's the vertex form of a quadratic or a parabola. If you know that, I was mystified. What's the only answer? What's the answer? D. If you know that form, there's no, they're asking you about the vertex. The only way you can find the vertex is if it's written in vertex form. That's the constant they're talking about. Now, once again, I appreciate you telling me it was D. All right, I want everybody to be able to say, yep, yeah, that's obviously D. That's the vertex form. Does everybody see how simple it is, right? That's the answer. Now, to me, what was really dumb was, I know the answer is not C. Never heard of that form before. I know it's not B because this right here, please look. This is a zero. This is a zero. So the factor would be X minus five. This is a zero. So the factor would be X plus three. You need to know that. That's why I was able to eliminate what? That's why I was eliminate B. So I know it's not B or C. All right. And A is X intercepts. So that's how simple that problem is. But most people don't know vertex form. All right. Review that before you take the test. All right. Now let's look at 42. Silly, silly, silly. Everybody look at 42. Everyone just tell me the answer. No work involved. None at all. No work involved. X intercepts. D, thank you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Form A or, or, or letter A, does that make any sense? I'm hoping you could say that was really dumb. A is dumb. C is what? I never heard of something written like that. Believe it or not, B is also vertex form. All right, but it just depends on what algebra two teacher, pre-calculus teacher you have. All right, that's a form. But D is clearly the what? Intercepts, X intercepts. Now, does everybody understand what I'm saying? Look how simple that is, very simple. All right. Here we go, 43. Come on now. Tell me, A? Somebody else? And what else? B? So now, good question here. Which of the following is an equivalent form of the function f above, in which the minimum value appears? So the minimum is the what? What, what's the minimum called on a quadratic or a parabola? Yeah, that's good information right now. Yes, thank you, whoever said that. It's the vertex, All right? The minimum is the vertex, everybody agree? So it must be written in what type of form? It must be written in vertex form. That's the only way to get the vertex as a constant. All right, now, A, I was confused because zero negative 24 is the vertex, right? You, that's vertex form, does everybody agree? But the problem is, is that the same as this? It's not the same. That's what threw me off for just a second. Does everybody agree with what I'm saying? So A is not the answer. Is B vertex form? It's not vertex form. We can find the vertex, but that's not vertex form, right? So I knew it wasn't B. 
uh oh now i just have to know which one is the vertex those are both written in vertex form right now i want to say something to everybody i think this is important the vertex is always the midpoint of the zeros is everybody with me on this so this zero is at negative six and positive four does everybody agree with that so the midpoint is the average. So you add those and divide by two. So the vertex would be located at negative one. Now that was hard. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking if, if you're not sure what I'm doing, please tell me. Does everybody agree? The vertex has to be found at negative one. Now, again, I'm just gonna review y equals a parentheses x minus h squared plus k. This h is the x coordinate of the vertex. So it's the opposite. See this negative? So that's how I knew it was what? That's how I know it's d. All right. Now, again, I'm not showing you information, right, as far as math. I'm just giving you what? Knowledge that will help you understand that question. There's really no math involved. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Again, graphing the quadratic or the parabola is really, really important. Okay, just to beat a dead horse here. All right. Let's look at 44. It says the graph of the equation above in the xy plane is a parabola. Which of the following is equivalent to form of the equation, including the x and y coordinates of the vertex? Everybody should just circle the answer. And hopefully you feel better about it now. The answer must be what? Must be A. All right. If you knew it was A, I feel good about that. All right. That's just problems on the test I can't believe are on there. Because if you know the vertex form, that's the answer. If you don't know the vertex form, you can't do the problem, really. Okay. So 45. Now, this is something I just want to review with you also. Standard form, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Somebody please tell me what c is referred to in this format. Do you remember? Because that's what they're asking you about. Is it the y coordinate of the vertex? No, definitely. Is it the x intercepts? Definitely not. The x intercept of the line of symmetry. I don't even know what that means. So it must be the what? Must be the y intercept. All right, so on the standard form, I want everybody to remember this. C is referred to as the y intercept. All right. Again, I'm trying to make this clear, guys. Everybody understand these are just questions right off the SAT. Exact same questions. All right. That's just knowledge based information. If you're good with quadratics, that translates into a better score. And for whatever reason, quadratics are hard. All right. Just again, just different formats. Let's look at this real quick. Which equation shows the x-intercepts? They're trying to, they, they just really tried to trick you here on this one. I thought this was hard, okay? So I can understand if you're, you're not with me. First of all, I want everybody to write down x-intercept. What does that actually mean? Thank you, that's exactly correct. Everybody should know that. The x-intercept means when the y value is zero. So that clues me in up here. If I plug zero in for y, the x value, be careful now. If I plug zero in for y, the x is equal to what? 11, 11. yay, x is 11. Everybody okay with that? 
So I know the x-intercept is 11. So because I know the x-intercept is 11, now can you tell me what the answer is? Now, remember, when it says it's a constant, that means you have to look at the equation and tell me what the answer is based off of that number. You must see that number in the equation. So the answer, everybody, is A, right? That is A. All right. Now, again, these little side notes down here, I think, are important. The side notes, I think, are important. And again, if I'm not clear, you just have to tell me. All right. Is everybody good? That's really important. Now, does everybody agree? I'm not really showing you any math right now, right? We're just interpreting the problems and understanding the equations. Yes. Uh, you said... We knew it was A because it's a constant, so the, the one keep it, uh, Yes. Beautiful. Do you see that? 11 right here. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, there's no other 11. I'm not saying you can't get an 11, but that's what they're saying when it says it shows as a constant, and 11 is the constant. All right, hopefully that helped. All right, let's go on. Let me see if there's another one. Um, yes, let's find the vertex. All right, I, I said something a minute ago. Can somebody tell me where would the ver where's the vertex located? Lowest point of the problem, but it's also between what two things? Yep, the two X what? intercepts thank you it's between the two x intercepts all right so I, I do think that's important listen to what i just said all right the vertex is in between the two x intercepts so on this problem right here what are the two x intercepts guys tell me what the two x intercepts are Three, zero, one, zero. somebody said three zero and one zero and thank you. It's between negative three and negative one, right? So the vertex must be between negative three and negative one. Now, if you're not sure about that, let me know. Everybody agree? 100%. The vertex has to be between there. So what's the answer? Say it again. Yay, good job, B. Now, most people struggled with this, and the reason why they struggled with this is because they wanted negative one to be included. Does everybody agree with me? But it's saying the vertex is in between negative three and negative one. Does everybody agree negative three and negative one is between there, right? The vertex, that's the only one. Everybody happy with that explanation? Again, I'm trying to show you we're not doing much math right now. We're just doing the understanding part of the quadratics. All right, which is really important. All right, here we go. This one now, again, I, I wanna say I have all the problems. This we're gonna do some math on, but this is really hard. All right, this one was really hard. All right, so let me let you read it real quick, and then I'm going to start talking about it. I think it's one of the hardest ones. All right, I need some help now. Somebody tell me what the X coordinate of the vertex is. So I have a two so far. Anybody else? Yes. So this is X equals two. And this is X equals negative four. So the vertex is going to be located 
right in the middle. So what's right in the middle of negative two and negative four? Just to make sure everybody's with me on this, I'm gonna draw it. One, two, one, two, three, four. And of course you don't have to do this, but I'm visually trying to show you. So everybody see that would be the quadratic, right? So now what's the X coordinate of the vertex? Negative one. Right now, look how a simple drawing helped me solve this problem. And again, like I said, this problem is very hard. All right. So what I want to do is this right here, this right here, this would be the vertex because that's right in the middle. Think about it. Three units away here, three units away here, right? Because this point is right there also. Everybody happy with that explanation? So what does C equal technically? What does C equal? Right here's the vertex. Yes. And what is the X coordinate of the vertex? Negative one. Is everybody with me? So this point right here could be labeled negative one comma D. Does everybody understand that? And again, guys, I know that's hard, okay? I, I, I normally say things are easy and you know, this one I think is hard. So everybody understand negative one D is the vertex, all right? So now, what did I tell you to do once we have that point? What should I do to a point? Plug it in, right? So wherever I see X, I'm gonna put negative one, and wherever I see a Y, I'm gonna replace it with D. So I'm just gonna come right over here and write it again. Y equals A parentheses X minus two times X plus four. D is, Y is D. X is negative one. So D equals A negative three times three. That was really hard actually. That was really hard. All right. That's why I knew the answer was A. Anybody have any questions with that? Again, guys, I would I would review that. That was really, really hard, really hard problem. And I always tell kids, if you understand that, then you're in great shape. All right, that, like I said, that was really hard. Okay, now this is the frustrating problem. Everybody look at 49 real quick. Let's see if you can tell me what the answer is. Somebody tell me. Yes, sir. Anybody else? B? Really, really good. Because the roots are the factors. Now, again, this is something I, I need everybody to make sure you're focused on because, again, I just thought this was a silly question. If you know that, then you know the answer. Right, so I want everybody to put down, if it's a root, it's a solution. Does everybody agree with that? So if we work backwards then, X plus one had to be a factor. X plus three has to be a factor. X minus five has to be a factor. Look how simple that is, right? But it's very hard to see, to put it in the right context when you're looking at the problem. All right, how's that guys? Everybody okay with that? Anybody have any issues? All right, that's a really nice problem. All right, let's flip the page. All right, now if you understood what I said on 49, it's the same problem as 50, but just written differently. And this is what I'm saying, you're gonna understand the questions better, but now you gotta be able to change the context and look at the clues. 
So I want everybody to look at 50. Think about what I just said in 49 and see if you can tell me what the answer is. All right, someone tell me. I got a, I, someone said B, I believe. And someone said a C, I believe. Somebody said A, that's good. Anybody for D? B? Okay, now, those of you guys who put B, all right, I'm happy. I'm not saying it's correct, but I'm happy because you were thinking, all right? Notice I'm gonna show you the relationship now. Please, I'm gonna scroll back to 49 and you're gonna see if you see, understand better now. I said in 49 that the zeros or the roots are part of the factors. What does that mean? That means when X equals negative one, what does Y equal? Zero. When X equals negative three, Y equals zero. When X equals five, Y equals zero. So the zeros or the roots literally mean when the Y value is zero. That's why they call it a zero. Most math teachers don't tell you that. A zero literally means when the Y value is zero. All right, so now, with that now, let's review if you're paying attention, trying to get you to see a connection. What is the zero of this function right here? Which one is the zero? Say it. No, no, I'm, st I'm saying, looking at the table, which one of those is a zero? Four is a zero. Thank you for listening. Four is the zero. Why is it the zero? Because that's when the Y value is zero. So X equals four is the zero. So that means that the factor must have been X minus four. All right, so I truly understand what some of you are trying to do up here. I understand what you were doing. All right, is everybody with me on that? Again, I'm just trying to say, look how much better you are right now if you're just understanding what I'm telling you. These are easy problems if you understand what I'm telling you. If you don't know what I'm saying, you're not gonna know it when you take the SAT. And what I'm trying to emphasize is these problems just occur over and over and over and over in a, just a different form. All right, that's why you're practicing. Make sure you see the form, all right? That's a really good problem, really simple, all right? Now, of course, everybody's gonna get this right now. Please, let's get it right. So without any hesitation, please. C, yay. All right. Hopefully I'm making some progress here. Hopefully you're understanding me. All right, x-intercepts. Another word for x-intercepts are the zeros. When the y value is equal to zero. Is everybody comfortable with that now? All right, hopefully you feel good about it. All right, now, uh, for those of you guys, this isn't really on the test that much. But I always like to tell kids, if you go back over your notes, occasionally, if you look at this, all right, you'll, you'll be able to see it, all right? This is called the remainder theorem. And this is from your algebra two days, all right? When you did synthetic division, all right? This is synthetic division which means you put three in the box, you had a polynomial function, and then you multiplied and added, multiplied and added, and then there was this left over down at the bottom. This was referred to as the remainder. That was referred to as the remainder. 
So that's why the answer is D. All right. And, and I always tell kids, I'm not a fan of this problem because that's just, do you remember that one week of algebra two? Occasionally, if you have a good pre-calculus teacher, they talk to you about the remainder theorem. But most of the time we just blow right by that because we don't see it that much. We don't really use it that much. So this is another thing I always try to teach kids that if you're trying to get above a 700, these small little details would be good for you to review right before you take the test. Because that's just a, a, a dumb fact that's on the test, in my opinion. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. And if you're like, man, I'm not 100% about what you're saying about the remainder theorem. I don't remember it. Then if you just look up remainder theorem, it'll go through a better explanation if you'd like that. All right. Okay. So now. Um, here we go. All right. This one is line of best fit. And again, I, I just would like everybody to draw the line of best fit. Now, does it necessarily have to be a line? No, it can be a quadratic. So draw the quadratic of best fit. All right. And then we're going to see what or how we know what the answer is. And again, I'm always puzzled by this because I think everybody should just know this. All right, I'm gonna draw it and you see if yours is close to mine. All right, so when I'm drawing this, I'm looking like something like this. All right, can it be a little bit different? Of course, it doesn't have to be the same. Everybody agreeing with me? So, does that quadratic open up or down? So I know if it opens down, it can't be which two. It cannot be A or C. And these are the types of things I just don't understand why this would be hard. Now, I'm estimating the y-intercept, which we said already was C. So my y-intercept, is it negative 745? Or is it positive 745? It's definitely positive, right? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? No, I, I, don't, I don't understand the difficulty on that, right? That's, that's, believe it or not, a hard thing for kids, right? And I believe it's hard because kids want the algorithm to solve. Is there a way to solve that? No, you have to draw the graph. You have to see it opens down. You have to see what the y-intercept is. They're not asking you to calculate anything. All right, and that's why I tell kids on your test, draw things out. It'll make life easy. All right, I'm happy with that. Um, now we're just gonna get into solving. All right, we're gonna practice these because again, solving quadratics is important. All right, and I feel like I, there's no reason for me to give you time on this. It's just something you just kind of work with me, all right? And you kind of follow along. If you're good at it, you already know how to do it. If you're not good, you should follow my steps, all right? So anytime we're solving a quadratic or something, we always have to set it equal to zero, all right? So the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to distribute the X cubed. So I end up with X to the fifth minus five X cubed plus four X equals zero. Now I must know that there's a common X. So I'm factoring out an X, X parentheses, X to the fourth minus five X squared plus four equals zero. Now this one you should say, okay, it's not something we do every day, but it's to the fourth power. So I know when I separate them, I'm gonna separate into X squared, X squared, and then I know this is a minus four and a minus one. And I always tell kids smiley faces, negative four X squared, negative one X squared gives me the negative five X squared. And now you have it factored, right? Then you have to say, well, X squared minus four can be factored again into X plus two 
times x minus two, x plus one, x minus one. And now we're looking for the solutions. Set the factors equal to zero. And now please, I, I don't, I don't wanna go fast, but I just feel like we've all had algebra two. We should know factoring. Some of the, the way they teach you factoring is horrible, all right? So if you're not understanding what I'm doing with the factoring, I can explain it real quick. Is everybody comfortable with how I did the factoring there? All right, so does everybody understand the solutions are zero, plus or minus two or plus or minus one, right? But we have to read carefully. We're only allowed the ones that are greater than zero. So you would have to bubble in either a what? A one or a what? Two, you have options, all right? It could be a one or a two. Everybody okay with that? All right, I got a few more minutes before we got to go on to the next lesson. All right, so definitely, definitely, I want everybody to take a look at number 55. Again, this is a simple quadratic, all right? Now, the first thing that's gonna make life easy for you is if you learn to say, can I simplify first? And I can, because I can divide by what? If you don't do that, it's annoying. So again, I always tell kids it's not in a hurry, all right, you wanna be accurate. So I've got, does everybody agree? I'm dividing everything through by three. So I have x squared plus four x plus two equals zero. And now it doesn't factor, so I'm doing the quadratic formula. So again, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root, b squared minus four ac all over two a. Everybody needs to know that for the test. Now does everybody agree we're just plugging numbers in? So negative four plus or minus the square root, 16 minus four times one times two, all over two. Simplifying inside the radical, negative four plus or minus the square root of eight over two. And again, does everybody remember eight can be broken down into two radical two? So this equals negative four plus or minus two radical two all over two. Now, I always remind kids, you can only divide numbers and numbers. Or what I tell kids is the rational numbers can be divided with the rationals. Rationals and irrationals cannot be divided. So I can't divide the radical two with the two. I only divide each of the rational numbers by two. That's where I'm getting negative two plus or minus. I must put it there just for point of emphasis. So the correct answer was A. All right, everybody okay with that? All right, I feel pretty good. Okay, 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 good. I like 56, all right? Because 56 is gonna be enough, another chance to teach you how to use your calculator again, all right? So everybody, do me a favor, get your calculator again. Here you go, girls. <clears throat> again, lots of practice with the calculator. So take out your handy dandy calculator. This, is why I, I, I was really upset about teachers and not letting you use calculators because it's a big part of all your exams, being able to use a calculator, all right? So just to show you how powerful again and simple, all right, I want everybody to type in on their calculator under Y1, here we go. Y1 equals three X squared minus 14 X under Y2, Y equals X. Then you hit graph. Now, sometimes your uh, window is out of shape. So I want everybody to hit zoom standard and that puts it into a 10 by 10 screen. Now, if you look at your zoom standard, can you see the intersections now? 
All right. So then remember, you hit second calc, then you go down to number five, which is intersection. And then once you hit second calc five, hit enter, 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 and bingo. All right. There are two options. Right. They already gave you zero, zero. So you're trying to find the other one. And what was the other point of intersection? What was it? Five, five. Look how, do you agree how simple that is now? Right, I hopefully I taught you something with your calculator. All right, I don't mean to bore you, but I just think it's super duper important. Now, if you don't mind, if you don't know how to do it, just tell me if you don't know how to do it. Everybody good? Okay, I can come around and double check. All right. Now, what happens is this right here, you need to bring your cursor over here and you hit the zero point. That's why, because this sounds zero, zero. You know, you hit the cursor. So I need your cursor close to that point of intersection. Now you're going to put it in the intersection. So, what are All right, very nice. Everybody good? Good. Yes, now now the problem is it's one in that one, right? Yeah. So do it again. Second count. Let me show you something. Five. Now move the cursor closer to the Go back now. Slow it down. Very good. Go ahead and enter, enter. You got time left for this thing. Right. So you have to move the cursor when there's multiple points of intersection. You have to move the cursor closer to whatever point you want. All right, I'm happy, guys. Happy, happy. All right. So now, just as practice, because it's super duper important, I don't understand. This was a problem on the test. Number 57. All it is is type it in the calculator, find the point of intersection. All right. So everybody's doing that quickly, 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 quickly. All right. Type it in. Calculate the point of intersection. And we're going to use the calculator for the next problem, too. And as I come around the room, if you're struggling, you just let me know. All right. You got to be careful. Type it exactly in. All right. The way it is. And then calculate the point of intersection. If you don't know how to type something, let me know. I just use your calculator. Anybody need help? Girls have my data.
Yes, of course, of course, of course. You know that. All right. Now, again, um, I, I feel like that's really valuable information, knowing how to calculate intersections on your graph can save you a bunch of time. Plus, it can do it accurately. All right. Now, I really think number, oh, by the way, what was the point of intersection? Because, again, I want to make sure everybody's with me on this. We're looking for A, correct? And what is the A value? The X or the Y? The X, right? So what was the answer? Someone tell me, where was the point of intersection? Everybody comfortable with that? Everybody good? All right, there were two points of intersection, weren't there? So you could have had one of two answers. Bless you. Does anybody know what the other answer was? Does anybody tell me? I don't, I don't have it down. Eight, was it? Thank you. All right, so we'll go with X equals eight. Yes, that is actually correct. I just checked. Very good. Very good. Okay. Now, number 58, I want to I want to take a look at for a quick second on 58. Now, here is where I'm going to help you out a bunch. All right? Because again, K, listen to me. What cannot be the value of K? So I want everybody to come down next to A and I want you to put K equals K equals K equals and K equals. The graph intersects at exactly two points. All right, now I want everybody to look at the top function. I want everybody to rewrite that as Y equals negative KX plus one. And that's gonna be under Y1 and under Y2 is negative x squared plus k. Now, again, can I really type in k on the calculator? No. no, I cannot. This is where I'm telling you now, a lot of kids have a lot of trouble with this, so I want everybody to look up on the board. I'm trying to figure out which one cannot work. So does everybody agree k equals three? So then on your equation, you're gonna write in under y1, negative three x plus one, and under y2, you're going to do negative x squared plus 3. Everybody type that in, please. And then look at it. Does that intersect at two points? Is that a yes? If it does, then that's not the answer. So now we change K to what? We change K to two. Please go back everybody now, change K to two. And again, if you're struggling, you're like, oh man, slow down a little bit, please tell me. All right, everybody's just changing the value of K. And you're looking at the graph. Does it intersect twice? And then as you go through, you will e easily be able to tell that the final answer was what actually? I think it was D, wasn't it? Why is it that it says um, when they're graphed, they're exactly two points, so which of the ones cannot be K? Like why? Um, so, so what they're doing is you're graphing a parabola and a line, it can intersect at two, it can intersect at one, or it cannot intersect. You're trying to find the one that it doesn't intersect, right? And I believe D was the answer. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Say it again. Yes, I can. 
All right, everybody take a look at it. Going good. All right. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? All right. So again, I'm really happy with that. That's a thorough review of quadratics now. All right. So the next point is I'm looking at my time here. So yes, uh, exponentials, I just have to go over that. All right. I have to go over that. That's the other third really huge component, lines, quadratics, and exponentials. Exponentials, there's not as many. All right, so we should be able to go through these pretty quickly. All right. So again, I want everyone to look up on the board and see if you're okay with an exponential growth. Let's just review. Exponential growth means your graph grows more rapidly right? That's called an exponential growth. And the other one is called an exponential decay. Decay just means you're going down, you're losing value. All right. So you have an exponential growth, exponential decay. So generally what you say is Y equals a B to the X. If B is greater than one, it is considered a growth. And if B is greater than zero, but less than one, it's considered a what? It's considered a decay, all right? And that's all you have to know, essentially, all right? And hopefully that's not brand new, all right? Hopefully that's not brand new. Okay, so exponential means the variables in the exponent. So if I'm looking at 59, I know because they're talking about exponential function, I know it can't be B. I know it can't be C because the variable is not in the exponent. That's how I know it's not an exponential. Is everybody good with that? Now, it says that the y-intercept is D. We've talked about that a bunch. If the y-intercept is D, that means when X equals zero, Y equals D. Listen to what I'm saying. When X equals zero, Y equals D. So if I plug zero in for A, D to the zero would be one. Anything to the zero power is one. And then one times negative three would be negative three. So A is not correct. Yes. I'm going to plug in zero for X. So watch me. H of zero equals negative three times D to the zero. D to the zero is one. So H of zero would be negative three. It's supposed to be D. So that's why that's not the right answer. Now I'm gonna blow up on D. H of zero equals D times three to the zero. Three to the zero is one. One times D is D. That's why that's the answer. All right, again, thank you. Come on, I need everybody else to ask me something if I'm not clear. All right, is everybody happy with that explanation? Again, I really think this is super easy if you, if you just understand, you know, what is exponential? What does that mean? Okay, so here we go. Next, um, uh, this says calculator, but I'm not real sure, all right, if I wanna use a calculator. Let's look at this real quick, everybody. The number of microscopic organisms in a Petri dish grows exponentially with time. The function P above models the number of organisms growing for T days in a Petri dish. Based on the function, which of the following statements is true? We don't need a calculator for that. All right, I don't know why they put calculator there. All right, so what am I multiplying by? Three, does everybody agree with that? That means it's tripling. Normally organisms what? Double. Right, they split, they double, right? All right. But in this case, you're multiplying by what? Three. So we know that it would have something to do with triples. Does everybody agree? So just based off of that, I know it's either what? A, 
or C. And I really enjoy crossing things out because I know that's not an answer, but you gotta be careful with what you think you know. Now, is it gonna triple every two days or is it gonna triple every day? Here's the key right here. It's gonna triple every two, right? Because on day two, please look, on day two, what's two divided by two? So that it'll triple, right? Every one day, it will triple half of it. All right, I hope I'm making sense on that. I, I never, like I said, to me, this was easy because it's kind of logical thinking, right? Is anybody not sure what I'm saying logically about tripling? Triples every two days. All right, I don't know why they put calculator. All right, here we go. Okay, now this was something on the test. I, I just think it's important to go over and then we just need to move on to the next lesson, but we should be almost there. So again, here guys, I always tell kids, the denominator is the root. The denominator is the root. The numerator is the what? Is the power. Yes, sir. Of course, you guys, please don't ask me. You guys feel free, you're, you're big kids. The restroom's right out there, all right? Go and come back as quick as you can. I don't want you missing anything, all right? So here we go, power and root. So this is A to the cube root squared. Like I said, that's, not, I'm, that's a question on the SAT, right? I, I never understood that, right? You either know the rule or you don't know the rule. Right. There's nothing I can do for you on that. That's why I tell kids, please review the rules. All right. If you know that rule, boom, you're just going on to the next problem. All right. Just like over here, this problem annoyed me a lot. One half power means square root. Does everybody agree with that? So what's the square to 16? Four. So it's not C or D. Now, what's the rule? Power to power, you always multiply. So nine times one half is nine over two. Answer B. Does everybody agree? Now, I know for certain that most kids missed question number 63. And like I said, I just don't understand. All right, so I want everybody to look at number 63 if you were paying attention. What does the denominator mean? The root. So on everybody to write, the cube root of negative four X cubed what? Squared. That's what that means. So what is negative four squared? 16. And what is X cubed squared? So this is the cube root of 16x to the sixth. So first of all, I know the answer is positive. Do I agree with that? So right off the bat, I knew it wasn't what? A or B. Now, does everybody see the cube root of 16? Does everybody see the cube root of 16 here? Does everybody see there's also another what? Two. I can't have two times the cube root of 16. There's no two in there. So that's why I knew the answer was what? Process of elimination, people. That's what I try to teach kids all the time. I don't have to know how to do it. I can just process of my elimination out of to the answer. Now I'm asking you, does anybody have any issues with that question right there? Because of course we know the cube root of 16 breaks down to eight times two, and then the cube root of eight is two, and the cube root of x squared, or x to the sixth is x squared. So that's the actual answer, but do I really even care? I don't care because I just figured it out without doing all the work. All right, hopefully people are understanding me, and hopefully you would ask me. All right, now, 64, old school, SAT, all right? So now, 
I always tell kids, please watch me. This information is hidden in this information. All right, watch what I'm doing. It's, it's a really simple problem, but teachers don't teach this to you. All right, so please watch me. Does everybody agree that eight is the same as two cubed raised to the X power divided by two to the Y power? Does everybody agree with that? And we already said power to power, we multiply, right? So now this is two to the three X over two to the Y. Does everybody agree with that? Now, when you divide, what do you do to exponents? Subtract, right? Is everybody agreeing with me? So now you should be able to tell me that that's the same as two to the three X minus Y. Does everybody agree with that? Now you understand me. What is three X minus Y? What is three X minus Y equal guys? 12. Now you see three X minus Y, two to the 12th. There you have it. That's a fancy little tricky question. All right, very tricky. All right, that's a really good problem to review. Really good problem to review. All right. Now let me see how much. Yeah, man, I'm having so much fun here. All right. So um, listen, let's take a, a three minute break. All right, you guys stretch a little bit and then we'll finish up the last. Uh, believe it or not, man, three hours. Time flies when you're having fun. All right. So again, take a few little break. You need to get a little drink of water or something. All right. I'm going to pause the video um and swing again all right so here's what i was trying to tell you about these recordings oh, sorry about these problems right here is that this is a really tricky problem to solve mathematically and i always tell kids when they give you these equations it's much better to just plug the numbers in it's much better to just plug the numbers in, all right? So what am I talking about? The first thing I wanna look up here is I would push this negative or positive four over here just because I want it to be easier. So I want you to say the square root of two X plus six equals X minus one. Is everybody good with that? All right, now all I'm gonna do is start by plugging in negative one. Look how dumb this problem is, please. If I plug in negative one, can a square root equal negative two? Can a square root equal negative two? No. So I know negative one is not an answer. So because negative one is not an answer, A, C, and D are out, I'm moving on. I'm glad some of you thought that was funny because it is hilarious to me. Some people literally, they did what? They squared both sides. Then they factored, then they set the factors equal to zero, then they solved, and they took five minutes on that problem. When all you have to do is whenever they give you equations, it's multiple choice, I promise you 95% of the time it's easier just to plug the numbers in. All right, make sure you make yourself a note of that. Plug numbers in when it's dealing with an equation. Plug numbers in when it's dealing with an equation. All right, just like down here, look at how dumb this one is. That would take me probably three minutes to solve that out. Not if you plug numbers in. Is it possible that three is the answer? No, because you can't divide by zero. So I know three is not an answer. So because I know three is not an answer, I know it's not B or what? So that means is one an answer? One has to be an answer. So is there a value for plugging one in? No, because it's gonna work. So all I have to do is plug in what? If two works, then C is the answer. If two does not work, then what? A is the answer. Now look, I'm giving you really good information. All right, I really hope you listen to what I'm saying on that now. 
That's critical information. Now, again, most kids are horrible at fractions. So I'm gonna walk you through this to make sure you're good with your mental math on fractions. If I plug two in, what's two minus two? Zero over anything is what? Zero. So zero equals one half plus negative one. Is that true or false? False. So is two an answer? So the answer is what? A. I'm trying to show you the speed at which I'm doing things compared to the speed at which most people do things. They're trying to solve that equation. That is silly. Plug numbers in to equations. Much easier most of the time. Hopefully everybody agrees with me. All right. Now, um, we're factoring here. I want you to know the answer is D, but I'm not going to do that problem. All right. I'm not going to do that problem. Move everything with a Y to the left, factor out a Y and divide. All right. We've done a couple of problems like that already. All right. Functional notation. I would, I, if I don't get to functional notation, I just feel like I haven't helped you. All right. This is something that is really difficult for kids also because they don't understand notation. After you hear me, hopefully you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. It's really simple, really, really simple. All right, so let's look at this. They wanna know what G of three is. So that means plug three in for what? X. So here we go. Uh-oh, G of three equals F of three plus five. That's annoying because now I have to find F of three. F of three is equal to three times three plus five. F of three equals three times eight equals 24. So G of three is whatever F of three is. What's F of three? 24. What's 24 plus five? There you have it, guys, 29. Now listen to me, I understand if you don't know what I just said. I would like for you to tell me, hey, just show me what you did again. All right, anybody, I can repeat it. Say it again. Yeah, here we go. So I'm gonna go slower, all right? And I want you to realize, all right, this is what I would tell kids all the time. This is just knowing and understanding. The question says, what's G of three, right? So I find the G function, which is right over here. It says that G of three is F of three plus five. Do you agree with that? That's annoying because I don't have the answer. So I have to figure out now what? F of three. So F of three is going to be obtained using that. F of three is equal to three times three plus five. Do you understand that? And then I have... That's three times eight, which is 24. Does that make sense? And now what? I am telling you that F of three equals 24. That means I can replace F of three with what? 24. How's that? Good. I'm glad. Listen to me. Again, I tell everybody, functional notation looks complicated. It's not. It's not. All right. Everybody okay with that? All right, now the next one, listen to me, it's kind of tricky. All right, so let's see my, if I can explain it. I need to know what F of two is. So over here, I'm looking and I see this information right here. Does everybody see this? And it says it's the same as this. All right, now look, this is where this is where it's confusing. So does everybody agree with me? X equals two in this case right here. That's what they're saying, right? So wherever I see an X, I can put what? Two. So now three times F of two equals F of what? Six. All right, I'm blowing up there and making sure everybody sees that, right? I just plugged two in for X. So that's telling me that three times F of two equals F of six. 
Does everybody agree with that? Now look right over here, guys. What does it say f of six is? f of six is 12. So does everybody see this f of six? What do I replace it with? 12. Three, f of two equals 12. f of two has to equal four. That's easy. And believe it or not, that's a nightmare for most kids. That's really hard. All right, that's really hard. And I'm just telling you, I, I feel like people don't understand the notation. That's why it's hard. All right, now again, I appreciate someone asking me to repeat myself. I don't mind. If you're not seeing what I'm seeing, if I go too fast, you can, if you look down for just a quick second, you can tell me if I need to repeat it. Everybody's good now? Functional notations, easy points for you on the test. Easy points. All right, here we go. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of this because this is just, to me, if you can't do this, I'm in big trouble. Seriously, right? I'm not trying to be mean, but they're just asking me to do what? Add the two polynomials. So I'm literally just adding this. This was a question on the test. Literally, I'm adding 8x squared minus 7x. 8x squared minus 7x. I didn't even do the last part. You know what I'm, does everybody understand what I'm saying, right? You just have to be careful, right? Is everybody good with that? All right, basic information about polynomials. Same thing here, they're trying to throw you off with all these negatives, right? So again, I used to make my kids write this, plus and change the sign, plus change the sign, minus, plus, and I would circle it so I wouldn't make a mistake. Now you're just combining like terms. One X squared Y, plus one X squared Y is what? Two X squared Y. So automatically I know it's not A or B. Now for me, I'm just checking on the Y squared, the negative six Y squared. Negative three Y squared plus three Y squared. What did they do? So I know it's what? C. I don't have to do all of the work. I just have to work quickly and accurately. Is everybody good on that explanation? Straightforward, in my opinion. Throw lots of negatives in there. All right. Uh, 72 is really silly. Um, but you know what? So many kids that I work with miss this problem. And I, I said, I don't, I was just paying attention. That's all. So we're going to do 72. All right. So does everybody agree? I'm just distributing a 10. 100 y squared minus 1,100. You're just adding a zero. Then this was 100 y squared and a positive 7532. Now we're combining terms. 200 y squared. Then I'm subtracting 1100. Zero, zero. So that became plus six, four, three, two. Everybody agree with that? And now it says to add A and B. I'm literally just adding 200 plus 6,432. Uh, like I said, I, I wasn't sure what the problem was. Six, six, three, two. There's your answer. It looks, it looks weird. And like I said, Help me out now if, if, if you're not understanding me. All right, if I go too fast, you would tell me. All right. Um, and sometimes when I highlight things, that causes more trouble. So I try to highlight so you can see. But you're just adding the 200 and that together to get that. Everybody good? Oh, yeah. Like I said, guys. Um, Um, all right, I'm going a pretty good clip here. 
So let's do this. Everybody agree we're just dividing, right? So let's look at it. X cubed minus 9X divided by X squared minus 2X minus 3. Now this is just a factoring problem, right? Now some kids are excellent at factoring, some not so excellent. All right, so does everybody agree? The numerator, I can factor out an X. That becomes X squared minus nine. And then X squared minus nine can factor into X plus three, X minus three. Now here's where teachers don't do a very good job teaching factoring, but most people can do the most basic factoring. So we would agree that's X minus three and X plus one. And if you're not, if you're like, that's a weakness, you can tell me and I'll explain how I knew that was X minus three, X plus one. Is everybody okay with that? So then this is X minus three times X plus one. And then of course the X minus threes cancel. And then we just look at back at our problem. That was just, do you know how to factor, right? In functional notation. All right, is everybody happy with that explanation? Good. Okay, okay, okay. This one, I'm glad I stopped here. I'm decreasing by 10%. I'm decreasing by 10%. That means I get to keep what percentage? 90%. This is an exponential. Right, does everybody agree? I normally have 100%. If I lose 10%, I get to keep 90%. That's how automatically I knew it was either C or D. Now, we lose 10%, and we talked about this earlier, we tripled every two years. So you don't multiply by two, we divided by two. So if we lose 10% every 20 years, that means we what? We're dividing by, we're dividing by 20, not multiplying by 20. And to me, I tell kids all the time, to me, that is just understanding right? That's just understanding. All right. Now, if you look at me like, how do I know that? I'll explain it better. Is everybody okay with that? And again, I'm thinking back to the problem we did earlier where we tripled every two days. We were able to see that we put three and then we did T divided by two. Same principle here. Every 20 years, you're losing 10%. So that means you divide by 20. All right. Hopefully that was good an explanation. All right, really super important. Okay, now this is not a calculator problem to me. Cross out calculator. Is this linear or is it exponential? I'm growing at 1.9% per year. Is that linear or exponential? Exponential. A percentage means that it's changing, all right? Linear means that you're adding 10 each year or adding 20, the same amount. Exponentially means it's changing every year. So that's how I knew the answer couldn't be what? It can't be C or D. Now, the biggest mistake kids make is they look at 1.9%. That's everybody should put down 100% plus 1.9% is 101.9%, which is what answer? A. But of course, everybody sees 1.9, so they think they're brilliant, so they circle B and move on. That's a what? 90% increase. If you don't know that, you can tell me. 0.9, 1.9 is a 90% increase. That's what that literally means. Everybody's good with that. Again, really good, fine problems that you don't have to be better at math at. You can just know that information. All right, I'm happy with you. All right, here we go again. Everybody's on 76. Let's see if I did a good job on this one. 
A biologist grows a culture of bacteria as a part of an experiment. At the start of the experiment, there are 75 culture. The biologist observed the population doubles every 18 minutes. If it doubles every 18 minutes, is it exponential or linear? Exponential. So I know it's not what? B or what? B or D. So, wow. Here's an example of something that I'm not sure, but I think it's A, but that's what they want me to think. So if I didn't know how to do this problem, I would probably select what? I would probably select C if I didn't know, because 18 is what they want me to pick, right? Now, listen to me, please look up here on the board and make sure you're good. It doubles every 18 minutes, but this is measured in what? Hours. Does everybody agree with me? So if you want to know how many times every hour, you would take 60, 60 and divide it by 18. That would tell you that's how they got 10 thirds. And that's why that's the answer. I'm really happy we did that problem. All right, now hopefully everybody understood what I'm saying. I knew it wasn't linear, so I know it's not B or D. And if you're going, well, I don't know. I didn't know how to do the problem. You realize, and if we re reference earlier in the day, I said the obvious is usually not the answer. So I would have eliminated A, right? So we know the answer is C. Is everybody happy with that explanation? All right, that's another really good problem. All right. Now, I just don't care about 77 right now. So we're running out of time. So I wanna just speed the process up a little bit. I think we talked about that one enough. Now, I'm, I'm so upset. Huh. I put this on my last algebra test and most kids missed it, right? And I was like, I, I don't, what else can I do, right? I don't want you to solve the problem. I want you to what? Plug numbers in. Somebody tell me what the square root of nine is. What's square root of 64? So the square root of what number plus three equals eight? I mean, I, you understand what I'm saying? It's frustrating, right? I mean, I just don't understand it. People miss this. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this is not even a high school question now, come on. But most of my high school kids, they wanna solve this out. They square both sides thinking they're real brilliant and they, you know, you can't square through addition. I just can't tell you enough. It, be careful. Be careful. Plug the numbers in. You'll be much happier. All right. Same thing here. I'm just so mad at my kids when they miss this. Is two an answer? Can the square root equal negative two? Is two an answer? Not possible. So right off the bat, I cross out what? Now, negative one. Are you having trouble with the square root of negative one plus two equal negative negative one? I mean, that you see what I'm saying? I don't, I don't know who they're kidding. Two minus one, square root of one is one. Negative, negative one is the answer. I see what I'm trying to show you. Don't solve the equation. Plug the number in. Plug the numbers in. It's much quicker, much more efficient. All right. Hopefully you're hearing me on that. All right, I'm totally happy with that. All right, now I'm not doing 80 because I already said this enough times. When they give you a point, what do we do? Plug it in. All right, make sure you're hearing me again. Plug that in. X is three, Y is six, and you'll solve. That's too easy. All right, we're skipping 80. Oh, guess what I just did. <laughs> Uh, I did all the extra practice for you. All right, you're welcome. I was just scrolling through here, having so much fun. All right, so now you don't have homework. All right, so we already did those for you. You're welcome. All right, here we go. Problem solving and data analysis. All right, this is, I feel like it's kind of a weakness, but I feel like mean, median mode, range, standard deviation. All right, if you haven't had statistics, you don't know much about standard deviation. So let me just say this real quick. Standard deviation. It's just how close your numbers are together, right? The
the further apart your numbers are, the bigger the standard deviation. All right, that's all that means. All right. Now, again, um, if you haven't had statistics, you would never know that. All right. So that's why I feel like this is kind of silly to put these questions on there. I'd say there's one question every other test on standard deviation. All right. So it's not really even a big deal. Box and whiskers I teach to my sixth graders. Then what are they doing putting it on the high school test, right? Because who's done a box and whiskers since they were in sixth grade, right? Unless you're taking AP stats and then they do that. And I'm doing math all my life and never once have I used box and whiskers to help me with anything. All right. So I, I think box and whiskers is just taking the median and then taking the median of the lower and taking the median of the upper. So you're dividing the data into quarters. That's why they call it quartiles. Or right, a lot of teachers don't show you that either. But the box and whiskers is just dividing data up into quarters. You're taking the median, and then you take the median of the lower and the median of the upper, and that's what you're doing, separating them. All right, very easy. All right, probability is kind of tricky for kids. This stuff down here, I, I just feel like everybody's had algebra two is good at that. All right, so let's get going. All right. Um, now here it says, number 81, what was the median number of electoral votes? Well, the biggest problem kids do is they forget to put the numbers in order. All right, and are the numbers in order? 10, 11, 12, 13, 15. Yeah, it looks like they're in order, right? Most of the time they're not. All right. Now, how many states are there? Yes, there are. Thank you. But in this sample, there were what? 21 states that they did. You with me on this? Okay, so now listen to me. Look up here, guys. I see high school kids do this all the time, and it just, it just I don't know, it gets on my nerves. But listen to what I'm saying. They do 21, they cross out one, 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 one. Then they get all the way to the middle, right? But we're not doing that anymore. If there's 21, right? 21 divided by two is about 10.5. So that means, listen and watch, there's 10 numbers over here. There's 10 numbers over here. So we're, the middle number is the what? The 11th number. Listen to what I'm saying. 21 numbers, if you divide that by two, that's 10.5, which means there's 10 over here, 10 over here, and the what? The 11th number is the median. Is everybody with me? Now we're gonna count the 11th number. All right, now watch me count the 11th number. Four, uh-oh, four, eight, nine, 10, the 11th number is what? 15. You don't want to go one from the bottom, one from the top, and tick, 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 all the way down to the middle, right? Now, let's say there were 22 states. Is there really a middle number? So there's 11 here and 11 here. So we find the what? 11th and 12th, and we average it. Is everybody with me on that? All right, I don't want you to because eventually one of the tests, it was like 75 or something like that. That was fun to watch them knock out as they go down, right? But we wouldn't do that. We would just say 75 divided by two is 37 and a half. So we're looking for the 38th number. All right, that's what we're doing, all right? So again, that's a big help if you just learn that little thing with medians, the one in the middle, all right? Here we go, next. Um, based on the graph above, and how many of the games played? Ooh, this was really good. All right, here we go. And again, I don't know why this is a calculator. I wouldn't do calculator on that. So how many games were there? 29. I want the median. So let's visualize 29. All right, so what game represents the median? The 15th game. Is everybody with me on that? 14, 14 makes 28. The 15th game is the median. So I'm looking for the 15th game. So here we go. How many games scored one goal? 
How many games scored two goals? So the 15th game scored what? Two goals. Does everybody agree with that? So how many games were there? How many? No, no, no. How many games scored two goals? That's the answer. There are so many ways to miss that problem. So many ways to miss that problem. Now, again, I need some help here, guys. It, I, I feel like that's obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious. If it's not so obvious, just speak up and I can say it again. Everybody good on that? All right, that's a really good question. Most people miss that one. Um, all right, so now, um, I'm trying to show you the, we want to find the total number of seeds. Does everybody agree with that? Now, um, listen, does everybody mind? I, I think I want to, if you're taking AP stat, this is really cool. You already know this, but some people I think need to learn to use the calculator for this. So what I want everybody to do is I want everybody to take out the calculator. I'm going to show you how to find the average I'm going to show you how to find the median. I'm going to show you how to find the quartiles. Um, I think that's a good thing to know. All right. Even if I miss some of the other topics, I feel like this is really helpful. All right. So again, I want everyone to look up on the board here for me. Does everybody agree there are two apples with three seeds? Right. So three, three, then there's five apples with four seeds, right? One, two, three, four. No, 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 that was bad. There were four apples with five seeds. So I needed to make five, 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 five. Does everybody agree with that? And then there is uh, one apple with six, two with seven, and three with nine. Does everybody agree with this? All right, now I just think this, I know everybody can do that on the math. I know everybody can add those up and divide and get the answer, correct? That's not what I'm doing right now. I'm gonna to try to show you how you can find the standard deviation. I'm gonna show you how to find the average. I'm gonna show you how to find the median, low, high, all of that on the calculator, all right? So here's what I want everybody to do. I want everybody to hit the stat button, all right? S-T-A-T, -T, it's right in the middle somewhere. And then the first thing that comes up, if I'm not mistaken, is edit. So you hit enter. Then L1, L2, L3, L4 lists come up, all right? Under L1, you're going to type in these data points. So under L1, I want everybody to type in these numbers. And three, three, then you hit four fives, then a six, two sevens, and three nines. Everybody do that. You, you with me? I know it's kind of new for you guys. Do I need to show you? Yeah, it's okay. So did you hit, did you hit, uh, and then hit enter. And then the list comes up. All right, so let's do this up. All right, so is it now, again, if you're not sure, tell me, because I'll come around and show you where it is. Is everybody with me? Is everybody type that in the right? Okay, now once you type those numbers in, are you okay? Let me see that. Okay, so we want to clear that. Oh, what you forgot to do was you hit enter every time. That's all right. So let me go to the top. Okay, that's right. You're not going to do it. So type in. You still need three, enter. Uh, yeah, you have to hit enter after you type in every number. Is everybody good? Anybody else need me to come around? Everybody's good? Okay. So now you're in my All right. So again, once you type those in, now what I want everybody to do is I want everybody to hit stat again. Now you go over to calc and it's one variable statistics. You hit enter and then hit enter, enter, enter. And then it spits out a bunch of information. Uh, you go over to uh, one variable statistics, number one, hit enter, and then enter all the way through. 
and then a bunch of information. X bar, put this down, X bar, for those of you guys who've had statistics, you obviously know that means average. All right, so if I said, what's the average, that tells you what the average is. All right. Now, believe it or not, the next number is the sum of the numbers. So if I were to add three, three, five, 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 six, seven, seven, nine, 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 that would be the average. I mean, that would be the average, that'd be the total, 73, right? Now, the standard deviation is done weird, right? There's a formula for it. It doesn't matter what the formula is. But the next problem down here, this symbol right here is for standard deviation. And this also is standard deviation. And those of you guys in, in AP stat know what I mean when I say sample size makes a difference. The bigger the sample size, you either you use N minus one. If you have a small sample, it's N, right? But we don't care about that. Both of these symbols represent standard deviation. Hold on a second. I'll come back there, girls, if you're, if you're having trouble. All right, does everybody agree with me on that? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. All right. Then if you click down more after you go to the end, it'll give you median. It will give you quartile. It will give you lower quartile and upper quartile. All right, if you click all the way down, which is good information, because sometimes if you don't know how to calculate the standard deviation, you don't even have to know what it means. You just have to know how to type the data in and then it'll spit out the standard deviation for you. All right. So again, I really feel like this is super beneficial if you have no idea what standard deviation means. You now know how to calculate the standard deviation and you may not have any clue what it means. All right. So again, that particular information is not really hard I just feel like it's important, right? Because sometimes the numbers are bigger and I don't feel like calculating the average. I wanna let the calculator do the work for me because I don't wanna make a mistake, all right? Now, does anybody have any questions? Girls, did you guys, you good now? All right, I appreciate that. I appreciate your help, thank you. So uh, again, um, I feel like that's, that's pretty simple now. Does everybody agree with that? All right, that was a good lesson, a good review for that information. All right, now, um, what I wanna do now is everybody take a look at this guy right here. All right, we're not doing the problem because average is too easy. All right, please look up on question 84. All right, and it says, define the average of day one. So here is day one. And you're just adding those up. Is everybody with me on this? I don't feel like doing that. That's too easy. All right. Let's go to the next page. Yeah, now here's what I was talking about. So please, let, let's, I'm going to show you, even those of you guys who don't know anything about standard deviation, it comes up periodically. So I'd like everybody to look at this right here. So what I'm asking you to do is think about what I said. Standard deviation is how close the numbers are together or how further spread apart they are. So if everybody's looking at these numbers right here, from 80 to 76, and from 80 to 76, it looks like the standard deviation would be pretty close together, right? It looks like it should be about the same. But the problem is, there are 14 numbers that are what? 79. Does everybody agree with that? Then there are six numbers at 80 and six numbers at 76. So I'm trying to tell you that these numbers are grouped closely around what? 79. Do you agree with me? Whereas these numbers are more spread out. Is everybody understanding me on that? So we say that city A has a smaller standard deviation. But you're saying, well, I don't really understand what you're saying. If you don't understand what I'm saying, then you would type these in under list one, find the standard deviation, type 
the second one in under list one, do that standard deviation, then you can compare them. Does everybody agree with me on that? All right, so I don't really need to do anything more with this problem, all right? Again, we should know that, all right? And if not, I can understand if you haven't had AP stats. So I just wanna move on. All right, so here we go. Um, yeah, yeah, this one now, I do wanna look at 86, basic probability. And I really wanna look at 87 too, because I can I'm trying to show you how easy it can be but if you don't read carefully, it's really hard. All right, so everybody stay with me on 86. The table above summarizes the results of 200 law graduates who took the bar exam. If one of the surveyed graduates who passed the bar exam, who passed the bar exam, so I'm only talking about the people who what? Passed the bar exam. I'm only talking about these people. They're the ones who passed. And I'm choosing them at random. What is the probability that the person did not take the review course? How many people did not take the review course? Out of how many? That is the answer, seven out of 25. And of course, those of you guys who are taking AP stat, you have a huge advantage over people because we don't really study statistics that well. All right, so I'm just trying to show those of you guys who haven't stayed, taken statistics, that really wasn't that hard if you read carefully. All right, now I always tell kids, the ones that annoyed me, but I figured it out, but it took me some time, is this annoying problem right here. I want everybody to try 87. All right, that's super annoying. All right, I want to see if you are annoyed as I am and see if you can come up with the answer. I'll give you a minute. All right, anybody? Zero. Zero. Good. Somebody else. Come on, be brave. All right. Now I've got a problem because I think I went past my time for. Um, so hold on, give me one second. No, it's still recording. So let me just go back up. 27, I'm back. You're laughing at me. I'm sensitive, okay? <laughs> Share screen. All right. Come on, come on, come on. All right, we're back up and running. So I got one brave soul at zero. I've got one over seven. One over seven? I'm happy with that answer. One over seven. Someone else? No other brave soul. I just want to make sure I'm recording. It's going to look weird, but. Oh no, Get the head out of there. all right, that's it. One out of seven, no one else. All right, yeah, I can agree. This was super annoying. All right, super annoying. So I'm gonna try to read it and then I feel like they did this in weird order, all right? So it said, no contestant received the same score on two, day, on two different days. Now it says, if a contested, <laughs> If a contestant is selected at random, what is the probability that the selected contestant received a score of five on day two or day three, given that the contestant scored a five on one of the three days? So does everybody agree they're talking about only the kids who scored a what? They're only talking about the kids who scored a five. Now, again, I, I understand this was super annoying. All right, I'm agreeing with you. I read it like five times before I even had any idea what they were talking about. So 
I did know that they were only talking about those kids who scored a five. So how many kids scored a five? Yes, but all together they were what? Seven. But we want the probability that they occurred on day two or day three. Five over what? Whoa, 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 whoa. There's only how many kids? No, no, no. You're making a mistake because we're only talking about the kids who scored a five. How many kids scored a five? Seven. And how many of them scored it on day two or day three? Five out of seven is the answer. That's that, like I said, that's really hard. All right, that was really tricky. I've only had a couple kids who knew that right off the bat. Five out of seven. Okay, now, um, generally what I wanna do now is I do wanna show you a couple percent problems here because again, I feel like we did this in sixth and seventh grade and now all of a sudden they're asking me on the SAT for some strange reason and I forgot. All right, so let's look at this. A customer paid $53 for a jacket after a 6% sales tax. What was the price before the tax? All right, well, I don't know what the price was, so that was X. Then what? In order to find the final price, I multiply it by 1.06. And that will tell me the price plus the tax, which was $53. Does everybody agreeing with this? Everybody okay with that? And then of course, we just do 53 divided by 1.06. And that will be your answer. All right, which we know is how much money? 50, of course. Right, now please tell me if you're not understanding how I got the 1.06, right? The 1.06 comes from 100% for paying and 6% tax. So you have to pay what? 106% of everything that you bought. All right. So let's look at 89 real quick. All right. Giselle would owe 15,500 in taxes each year if she were not eligible for any tax deduction. This year, all right, now, uh, Gisela is eligible for tax deductions that reduce the amount of taxes she owes by this amount. All right, so basically we wanna know what the change is. Does everybody agree? And I would like everybody to write this down. It's the change divided by the original, all right? And that's the percent of increase or decrease, all right? So did they tell us the change already? Yes. So it was just 2,325 divided by 15,500. Is everybody okay with that? So do that for me on the calculator real quick. And what decimal was that? 0.15, is that the answer though? That's correct. So the answer actually was 15, not 0.15. So you can see how kids make minor mistakes on that as well. All right, one more, these percent problems. I don't know who this person is. <laughs> Whatever, all right. All right, so the number of cell phones sold in 2014 was 128% greater in 2013. And the number of cell phones he sold in 2015 was 29% greater than 2014, all right? So now, if it was 128% greater, remember, this is why kids miss this one, because it's 100% plus what? 128%, which makes it a total of what? 228%. So I knew it had to be either B or D, 
and then it was 29% greater. So it was 1.29. Yeah, I, I don't think that was too bad, but a lot of kids made a mistake and they put C down. All right, a lot of kids made a mistake and put C down. Is everybody okay with that now? All right, again, I'm just trying to show you details. All right, details here. All right, let me just go through a couple more because the percentages I feel like are not too bad. Um, yeah, let's, let's look at some imaginary numbers now. All right. Now, does everybody, some people didn't know this, all right? Did you know imaginary numbers are on your calculator? Right? Imaginary numbers are on your calculator. So what I want everyone to do is, I want everybody to practice typing it on the calculator. So I want everybody to type in parentheses around the eight minus I. Now, if you don't know, the imaginary number is the decimal point, second decimal. So I'd like everybody to type in eight minus I divided by parentheses three minus two I and then hit enter. And somebody tell me what comes up. Does everybody agree with that? I don't know, cause I don't have my calculator. Is everybody agreeing with me typing that in? Now look how cool that is. So A is what? A is two. Because A is the real number and B is the imaginary number. All right, so again, I always tell kids the imaginary numbers on the calculator is real nice, real handy. I don't feel like doing the work. If it's a calculator section, just type it in, boom, there's your answer. All right, for whatever reason, kids don't know that's there. All right. Um, now look, isn't this strange right here, guys? I mean, I'd, just very, very basic, right? Imaginary numbers take on all the properties that variables take on, right? So there's nothing to it. You're just doing seven minus eight and then three plus nine. All right, I, I don't feel like imaginary numbers are that important, all right? So now notice there's some additional practice problems. I went through one of them for you, so I'm not gonna do it for this one. So let's skip down. I don't have much time left, guys, I'm sorry. Now, again, I don't really feel so bad because the additional topics are very small portion. Look at what I'm saying. There's only what? Six additional topics, right? And the additional topics, Pythagorean theorem. Wow, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Come on, right? Similar triangles. Now, similar triangles are hard because a lot of people feel like they haven't had geometry in a while, but similar just means setting up a proportion. Most kids can set up a proportion, all right? Now, this Sakatoa is just basic what? Trig, all right, basic trig. Now, I do wanna mention this because I only have a few minutes and I, I feel like this is valuable. Sine and cosine complement theorem. All right, most people don't remember this, but in pre-calculus, if you've had pre-calculus, this is what they talk when they say co-functions, all right? So if somebody says to you sine of theta, that's always equal to the cosine of 90 minus theta, all right? Now, if you don't know what theta is, that's just a fancy letter. If you're not there yet, we would just say sine x is always the same as the cosine of 90 minus x. Now, what does that mean? That means when the sine and cosine are complements, they're always equal. So now just a brief information for you. If I said the sine of 10, that's equal to the cosine of what? 80. How do I know that? Because 10 plus 80 is what? 90. All right, now I'm just giving you this information because I know it's on the test. All right, that's what they mean. Now it's not on every test. I would say it's like on every third test where they're gonna ask you about that. And if you haven't had pre-calculus, you don't really know that, all right? But after you've had pre-calculus, those are called co-functions, just like tangent of X is equal to the cotangent of 90 minus X, all right? 
Now, um, I also want to tell you this, even though I don't have time, we know what the circumference formula is, right? That's always on the test. Arc length they're putting on the test. And those of you guys who had pre-calculus, you know that S is equal to R times theta. If you haven't had pre-calculus, I always tell kids it's not about that. Arc length is just a fractional part of the circumference. So I would like you to know that arc is equal to two pi R times N out of 360. All right, I, I just think that's just simple, simple. An arc is a fractional part of the circumference. All right, now the next thing, uh, area of a circle, it's the same principle, area equals pi R squared. And then if you want a segment of a circle, right? Or a pi, piece of the pi, it's just pi r squared times n out of 360. All right, that's the other formula that will kind of help you. Does everybody understand what I'm saying about that, right? And now the one that is on the test that I need for you to make sure that you're good at is the equation of a circle. So I'm gonna make sure I write that down for you. X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared equals R squared. All right, that's the important part. And then to convert that, uh, sometimes you have to complete the square. Sometimes you have to complete the square on that. All right. So that's something, if you don't remember how to complete the square, just go back and do a little study on completing the square. You'll be happy with that. All right. But this is definitely on every test. The circle formula is on every test. All right. So I would definitely review that. And then, of course, radians to degrees and degrees to radians. I really don't like that question because if you haven't taken pre-calculus, you don't know anything about that. But you have to remember the relationship between degrees and radian is pi and what? 180 or 180 over pi. All right, those of you guys who've had pre-calculus, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you'll just wait till next year uh, and you'll understand that. How to convert radians to degrees. Okay. Now, listen, I, I kind of rushed through this last section, which I feel kind of a little bad about, but I feel like the other things that we did were so, so important, right? So at some point, what I'm thinking about trying to do is um, trying to finish this up and post it. All right, so here's what I'd like for, to do. I, I don't know because I work with so many kids every day. I'm not sure when I can, but here's what I'd like for you to do. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Trent Strau, all right? And it's all my, you know, I'll put this up there as crash course. And I'm going to post today's four-hour stream. It might be, you know, kind of annoying. But if you forgot something, you can look it up. This I will probably label part one. And then I'll probably label crash course uh, part two. And I'll try to finish that last section up for you. So if you're interested in the solutions, worked out solutions, um, I'm not sure exactly when I'll be able to finish that, but I'll, I'll do my very best to get that posted. All right. Now, uh, the next thing that will help me out and help um, our business out is for you to take a look 